like that. This program was recorded on Monday, March 10th, in the year of our Lord, 2014. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of the station or its management. From the John DeVita Recording Studio, located in an un undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion, discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historians. Today we have a special show that is dedicated to Chicago's World Fair. And now, here's the guy who started it all, John DeVita. Well, thank you, Tom. From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, March the 10th, and it's the year 2014. Today, the panel will be talking about Chicago's World's Fairs between 1893 World's Columbian Exposition and the 1933 Pro Century of Progress World's Fairs. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now to start today's program, here is our announcer, Mr. Tom McKenna. And now here's our panel moderator. You know him, you love him, you can't live without him, Jack Red Ryan. Well, this is where the bulk passing stops, at least in this studio. How's everything going for everybody? Hope you're having a good day. Oh, it's warm out there. What more could you ask? For? It's getting there, isn't it? This is one of the few times that we get together when it's not some kind of a holiday. So let's declare this to be a national what? Well, it's St. Patrick's Day in just a few days. Well, that's all month. <laughs> that's all month. How about national end the winter day? How's that? Right, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go along. I'll go along. Except it's going to snow tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, with three or four inches coming tomorrow. Don't yeah. jinx it, okay, folks? Come on, let's not talk about it. Do do some of the enjoy our, our, on one the our one day of spring in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then it goes right to summer, doesn't it? I think you got two weeks of spring. No, don't worry. The snow will all be gone by the 4th of July. <laughs> hey, hey. Now watch. The first warm day, some will say, Boy, oh boy, is this hot. I yeah, we really wish it was cold. Yeah. <laughs> this hot weather is terrible. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, that would probably be mean. Al Gore or one of those with their... Oh, yeah, according to him, <laughs> yeah. the, the, polar, uh, the polar ice caps are supposed to be melted already. Yeah. Polar Express. Yeah. Uh, it's no longer global warming, it's climate change now. Mm -hmm. They revised it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all this sub-zero weather we've had, that's all a result of global warming. <laughs> I hope you understand that. That's uh, I don't mean, know, climate change has been going on for the last 10,000 years. So well, more than that. Since the creation of the world, there's yeah. been climate, <laughs> the climate has changed. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> We so anyway, up, uh, <laughs> going back to the 70s, they were saying we're going into a new ice age. Remember right, that? Right. All those uh, science magazines and those pseudo, you know, soft, well, soft uh, science stuff. If this winter has anything to say about it. <laughs> I, I saw. I happened to come across an old episode of of a much forgotten TV series called The Name of the Game, which Gene Berry starred in after uh, Bat Masterson and Burke's Law went off the air, mm -hmm. and and this was the, in the late 1960s. He's hit on the head, and he wakes up, and it's the 1980s. Mm. He's, it's the and the whole country is living underground because oh. of pollution. <laughs> the, uh, the civilization has come to an end, and the, the, the few remaining Americans are living in these underground tunnels and bunkers because the air is completely polluted, and it's like a dictatorship of the handful of people. And this is in the, the distant future, the yeah. 1980s. Well, they got the dictatorship yeah. part yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And they got the pollution yeah. right, too, when you get on the west side and Englewood. And, and, you what know, about can you imagine some, living underground there? <laughs> some of our other countries, like China and India, they're, they're, they're no, uh, they don't try to be any you know, uh, eco-friendly there. Oh, do they're they? burning I mean, coal. You know, yeah. Russia and China are burning coal to beat the band. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Right, yeah, we China, China's trying to clean the place up so they can get more tourists right there because tourists are not showing up. Where are they? They, they want to stay, have healthy lungs when they leave, I guess. The, the Chinese, they don't like to breathe anything that they can't see. <laughs> or, ta or taste, you know, it's got to be chewy. You know, There's a nice chewy. And it doesn't last long, you get hungry right away. It reminds, right. Me, <laughs> it reminds me, there's a group of rabbis touring China, and they're in a hotel in Shanghai, and they asked the waiter, and the, uh, one of them says, excuse me, are there any Jews in China? He says, oh, sure, pineapple Jews, orange Jews. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Once again, I, that was Jack Ryan. Yeah. And you know what? Send I can live without him. Send to Jack <laughs> Red Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get the name right so in case you have any complaints. Speaking of names, let's go around the table. First of all, our regular panel members, Al Opitz, Mr. Uh, Al Opitz, uh, chemical I, engineer. I, I, I used to be a chemical engineer. Yeah. I gave, up, railroad. I gave up work for lost cause. Yeah. <laughs> and next, uh, uh, the, the lady, the lady of uh, our, our answer to Mary Hartline. <laughs> Thank you. Super uh, Circus. We uh, are gathered here together, and I am uh, Jeanette Frontier, uh, formerly with WJJG. And you had your own show, right? Yes, I did. Which was? Uh, the Last Frontier. Isn't that ironic? Ah. Yeah. Um, ba -ba. It was a call-in, or uh, bum, 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 bum. we would, uh, you know, uh, play on something that you wanted to make it controversial by, as I used to say, come in by the back door mm -hmm. and give your version and then uh, uh, a lot of maybe on the personal end, you know, life stories and adventures of your own uh, Next up, uh, Mr. McKenna, our announcer and lifelong friend of mine. Lifelong friend of John, uh, Jack Ryan, Red Ryan, and one of the few one of the few people that still admit it. Still admit it, yeah, that's, that's what Filling in uh, as announcer today, retired Chicago police. Next up. And, and I was not alive during the last two uh, World's Fairs. <laughs> Just to clear that up. I am James Tiberius Kirk, and I will be alive in the next World's Fair in the 22nd. John S. Kachoko, also formerly with the great WJJG of, of Days Gone By, and also willing to admit that he's a friend of, of Jack Red Ryan. I hope that that doesn't reflect your political point of view. The, you know, okay. How come you, know, you notice they chose for the conservative states to make them red rather than the other? Because the other way would be too close to the truth. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, we, I noticed they were careful to do that. It's probably closer to pink anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, Bill Kugelman, uh, uh, and, and I was at the 1934 <laughs> World's Fair. Um, uh, nothing to do with my age, really. But uh, I'm, uh, I was also in the Chicago Fire Department, and, uh, the Union, and so forth, and with the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago, which will be have an open house on the fourth Saturday of every month from 10 to 2. Okay, where is that? That is at 5218 Southwestern. And uh, I, I uh, extend a, a, a welcome to anybody that wants to come. And, and you also, what else were you? With the president of the union? Uh, I was president of the union. I was deputy director of the Illinois Bureau of Racetrack Police. I have many hats, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> and all of them are big. And I would not <laughs> want to live with you. <laughs> <laughs> and our guest? <laughs> yes, sir, Rich. Yes, I'm Richie Z. Um, I've been in television and radio for the last 25 years. I used to also do a show at JJG. People probably remember Motor City Madhouse. But we took the mystery out of automotive history, and we did some Chicago history, too. But I uh, have my passion going on now. I, it's, it's more of a passion and fun for me. I started a new radio and, and television show called Chicago History and Automotive Heaven. We debuted our first show over at uh, www.talkzone.com. It's an internet radio station worldwide, and we're on every Friday at 11 a.m., but then it goes into my podcast, richiez.com. That's R-I-C-H-I-E-Z-I-E.com, and each show will be podcast in there. So uh, if you love Chicago history like all of us here do, tune in and, and check it out. Is that live on Friday? On Fridays at 11 a.m. it's live, and then the, the station actually rebroadcasts it. Uh, they loved it so much last Friday they go 
you know what? We only do one more re live mm -hmm. broadcast, but they're going to give me five a week now mm -hmm. in all different time slots. Mm -hmm. So you got to go to the schedule on the station to see where we'll be on again. So okay. it's, it's kind of cool. We're going to have a lot of fun, and I, I do tell stories that have never been told. I've never heard them, and I'm a historian. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you some more about that as we get into today's show because this is one of the topics I've worked on a lot, giving tours downtown and stuff. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'll talk more about it uh, in today's show. And special Good. guest, Rick Rand, who Hi. represents, co-director or, or, or promoter of the um, 20th Annual World's Fair Memorabilia Show, which is coming March 30th, a uh, couple of weeks, 10 a.m. to 4, at uh, Elk Grove Holiday Inn. You want to talk a little about that, sir? Sure. Uh, I'm Rick Rand. I've been collecting 1933-34 Century of Progress World's Fair memorabilia for about 25 years. I've lent items to museums, uh, participated, uh, lent photographs to WTTW for a couple of PBS things. Uh, also, history detectives, I donated some material that they use in their Sideshow Babies episode about the World's Fair Incubator Babies. Uh, at our show, we you can view film footage of the 1933 fair on video. There's also be a unique display of 33-34 memorabilia. There'll be about 20 tables of items for sale from the 1933 World's Fair and also the 1893 Columbian Exposition World's Fair and also other Chicago memorabilia. Does any any other fairs uh, find their way there? Or? Yeah, there there is. You will find miscellaneous other World's Fair there too, but it's primarily the Chicago World's Fair. Mm -hmm. You don't find anything from the Montreal's World's Fair, uh, 1967. Oh yeah, I have uh, stuff I have for sale. There will be stuff from 1876 Philadelphia up through 2008. I think 2000 is Hanover, Germany. But they had worlds. They currently even have world's fairs. So it's I have world's fairs up to I think about 2008. Everything in between. You know, world's fairs don't get the attention that they once did. There was a time when when the world's fair was like the Olympics. It was yeah. a big deal. Well, Mon like, Montreal '67 mm -hmm. and and even go well. As many people think that the '39 world's fair in New York may have been the greatest world's fair ever right, held. Well, but nowadays they come and you, I'm, I wasn't even aware there was one in, in Hanover. In Hanover, Germany. Germany uh, Japan, mm. Korea, they've been all, I bought a collection la a couple years ago from an estate, and this man was a book publisher, and he went to every World's Fair since 1964, and he, I had, he had one or two Rubbermaid containers from every single World's Fair. He saved all the receipts. He'd go for a week or two, he'd, and he'd take fun, fantastic photographs of all the pavilions. I think he wanted to do a book on all the pavilions at the World's Fair. He did do a children's book. Mm. But yeah, they, I mean, the world's so much smaller now, you can... Back in 1933, people flocked all over the United States to come and look at these World's Fair to see the different villages. In 33, sure. they only had about six villages. Those are so popular. In 34, they had about 15 villages. You'd go see the Holland, the Dutch village, mm -hmm. the Holland village, and you'd see people dressed up. But mm -hmm. nowadays, you can watch TV. Yeah. You can see it on the Internet. You can pick up the phone and call these people now. So it's just not as... I remember when I was in grade school, we used to get this weekly newsletter and I think it was, was, it on, was it on papyrus? Uh, yeah. No, it was actually it was actually oh. on tablets. Uh, tablets. Yeah. They were on tablets. Uh, this was in the days of the Roman Empire. When the messenger and, was it? Uh, the Emperor Augustus, I think, would always have a little message for the kids on yeah. it. But uh, and I used, I used to lie, I was a big fan of it. I think I got a I got a nice letter back from him once. It was a tablet too that I got mm -hmm. back from him. But anyway, there was a World's Fair in 1958 in Brussels. Brussels, right? And I remember this was a big mm -hmm. deal. There was a World's Fair in Br and it was it was like for three or four issues of this newsletter was all about the mm -hmm. Brussels World's Fair. Right. You know, right. Um, I wonder what why why did they have the 33 34? Was there a break in there? Did they Well, what it is is official World's Fairs, the fair, World's Fairs from what I understand have to be blessed by the international exposition community mm -hmm. and it's only once every 4 years and they're only supposed to have it for one year. If it's planned ahead of time, like the New York World's Fair 64-65 was planned to be two years, so I don't think it was an official, officially in the World's Fairs, because they're only supposed to be for one year. Mm -hmm. It went, the Chicago in 33, it was only meant to be one year, it went from about uh, May 30th through November uh, 11th, 
or at the end of October, they still owed money on the bonds that they had uh, drummed up for the fair. <clears throat> and the fair was still making a profit, so they decided in about October to extend it for another year. So then it reopened in 1934, okay. and then finally mm -hmm. closing on October 31st, Halloween in 34. And at the end of the fair, they ended up making a profit. Over 39 million people went to it. They ended up, up making a profit, which they donated to Airy Museums, oh, Art okay. Institute, yeah, Museum think, of Science and History. The 93 World's Fair was so popular that they wanted to do another year, but the construction was so poor that the, they couldn't bring it over for another year because it just wouldn't tolerate Well, it's the, the 400th well, anniversary of Columbus. It, it, was it was a year late to begin. It was supposed to have been in 1892 right, 1892. because of, of Columbus. The 400th yeah, and anniversary. They were, they were a year though. late in right. getting, getting it on the road. And and yeah. after after the Columbian Exposition, all those buildings burned down. Yeah. Well, the only one of them yeah. I, was meant to be permanent, yeah. the one that held the Palace of Fine Arts. It held all the arts, yeah. so that was one that was... One of the biggest reasons that it didn't go a second year under construction was <laughs> poor quality, was that the years prior when they were building it, the um, weather was worse than our winter was this year. The ground was frozen solid. Um, they had to actually dynamite the ground to get to, mm -hmm. to dig down to put concrete in um, they used a ton of hay to put around everything to keep it warm but that's one of the reasons when that most of them were like plaster Paris everybody knows um, it didn't dry it froze so they touched it up in the spring before the fair paint and stucco back then and that uh, but that's one of the reasons why it, it, it probably well, didn't the go. Other, the other problem they had when they first started building was the fact that they had swamp out there and the crowd came in from New York which had a higher uh, rock table to build on so they don't go down as deep but when they came here in order to get firm footing they had to dig a lot deeper so they invented caissons mm -hmm. okay. and hold the buildings up so this was one of the few inventions that really came out of 1993 90, World's Fair. Some of the buildings downtown Chicago are still floaters. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And they come, uh, some have uh, uh, actually uh, wood pilings in there, too. So surprisingly, you know, after 100 years, they're still stay, still uh, viable. You know, so you look at it that way. So actually, this year, because of the mud out there, they started mm -hmm. building caissons, and they learned how to stabilize buildings much more fe effectively. We'll uh, get back to the fair. We always like to have the... Uh this part of the show, we have what we call recent history, a.k.a. current events. <laughs> and does anybody have any current event they want to bring, city, nationally, internationally, locally, inter you know, well, the, the The world, uh, the um, Field Museum has now got a, a quite, and I haven't been there, but I understand it's quite an exhibit of the 1893 yeah, World's it's, Fair. It's a, I was there. It was very and, nice. Yeah, and, you know, they, at the, at the, uh, Fire Museum, we've got that statue of Christopher Columbus from there. Uh, I, I really wanted to get it out there, but uh, that's the I guess they've got right? a good... Yeah, yeah we, we've got that at the Fire Museum, yeah, and that's from the 1893 World's Fair. Yeah, the Field Museum, it's called Opening the, Ball, Opening the Vaults, Wonders of the 1893 World's Fair. Mm -hmm. It's uh, been oh. there since October. It runs till September 7th, 2014. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. They've brought out yeah, a lot of things that, that have, they've... I mean, the museum's only display maybe one percent of the stuff they have if that much yeah, so this is stuff they dragged out of the vaults which was at the 1893 yeah. fair they got, a, they got the movie going there too that you were talking about but they got a continuous loop of scenes of the 18 by uh, 1933 world's fair uh it's, it's the quality is quite you know because they didn't really have the highest quality at the time either but it shows you know, the activity and everything else, the kids, dress, and everything else. The, so uh, the, nice. the, the Chicago field. Historical Society has a permanent exhibit of the World's Fairs. Right. The, uh, the, I know the 1893 in particular, they have, they have exhibits on the second floor that I think are permanent. Uh, right. Now, before we, uh, let's get to that, got to get a little more on the uh, current events now, but before we do that, Bill Kugelman, how did you happen to be at the World's Fair? Can you tell us? Or? Well, I, I couldn't really see a lot. Uh, I was impaired uh, visually uh, because I was in my mother's uh, belly. 
Uh, I was <laughs> want to explain that. Born the 1st of uh, 1935, January 1st of but, it, but, it, Bill, other than that, how was it? And, uh, <laughs> Did you enjoy the food? <laughs> I didn't enjoy the food. Uh, my mother have, was on a diet. Were, were, were you able to grab a beer at least? <laughs> no, no beer that year. Yeah, Not till the end of the year. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, it I, was, uh, uh, well, was can't think of the it? name of it now. Uh, no beer. Oh, no prohibition, liquor. Yeah. Prohibition. They did yeah. have a personal liberty day at the fair, <laughs> and I have tickets good for a free beer at the World's Fair at the end of 33 when they it's had free good. beer. Oh. I've got a, a personal connection to the 33 World's Fair. I, when I joined our Kiwanis Club, we had uh, we had several gentlemen who had been, been members of the club for many years, and one of them who was a banker, but as a young man, he had worked as a carpenter at the World's Fair mm. in 1933. He had put together this the uh, the booths and the exhibits and the stages and whatever, and he, he didn't if he. he didn't have all that much to say about it, but just that he had worked there and had and could remember having been there, setting. And I think he said he he didn't actually go to it after working to uh, to to build all of all the uh, stages and, and so on. He didn't actually go there and attend it, so he really didn't remember that right. much about the fair other than, right. than working. And the timing it. He, for him, it probably was just a job. It was I mean, a job. It That's it was, exactly. It was yeah. a job. And this was the remember that this was the was depression. A rough time, right. Having a job was important, and, exactly. and it was work. And he probably couldn't go there because he probably yeah. probably had to worry about working. Right. He probably didn't even know what it meant. Right. Just let me get a well, job. The, right. the, right. the yeah. statue we've got from from uh, the World Fair from the '93 at the museum. Uh, there were, I believe, seven firemen, three of them from Chicago and four of them from the World's Fair Fire uh, Department that they had there, uh, and, and they were all killed in oh one my. of those uh, buildings. And, and to do something, you know, whoever's idea it was, uh, to, to memorialize them uh, was to give the city of Chicago the statue and it had a plaque in front of it dedicated to, you know, all these people. And uh, it stood in front of one firehouse for many years. Then it went to Engine 54's house on the south side. And uh, then it ended up in a warehouse somewhere. <coughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, typical Chicago. Somebody <laughs> probably would have sold it for, uh, for that. It's made, it, 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 it's for really scrap. unique. <laughs> it's made from paper thin zinc and and uh, it's lasted this long uh if if you i i never knew anything about the zinc uh, but if you you know could could get the bottom part which was like a inch thick steel uh, a base to it if you could take that off you could take that whole thing and just pick it up and walk away with it it's it's quite a you know quite a, a workmanship artistic work. Are you saying it pre it preserved during the fire? Is it was it like it the was last outside thing standing? Uh, or? Yeah, it was outside. Okay, it was outside. They they uh, our information is that there were three of them like oh. this. And it's zinc, so it won't rot or rust. Well, or yeah, rot. Zinc, yeah, zinc will turn yeah. white. Yeah. It'll, it'll, I mean, it uh, won't actually rust like iron. No, it will yeah. turn white, standing. but. If you're not careful, it will. No, grow. that is. Well, well this is, it's all painted. No, no, that's my, uh, like the kitchen, Columbia, kitchen zinc is yeah, usually yeah, white, and so huge. the bathroom yeah, be different yeah, colors, though, I know. Yeah, but anyway, let's Ta -da. <laughs> can, we, can we try to get this little, uh, recently now we, we had the Winter Olympics in Russia, after which, uh, Mr., uh, we, we, we were witnessing a little of, a bit of the Putin on the Ritz with an invasion. Well, after that, Russia Russia practiced its national sport, which is invading other yeah. countries. You know, right, that's, that's, a, that's a summer. Is a summer they wanted to get the gold in that, I think. So. That's probably just a practice run, like, <laughs> right, like. But, I mean, immediately afterward, it's like we had an invasion of the independent country of Ukraine. Does anybody see any parallels between 1938-39 in Europe? Sure, the, U the Ukraine is Czechoslovakia, yeah. Crimea is the Sudetenland, yeah. and, and Vladimir Putin is Schickelgruber, I mean, yeah. if, you wanted, if you wanted to use <laughs> the just, analogy. And it's like the, the pretense of protecting Russian citizens or Russian ethnics. Whatever it's it the it. same argument that Hitler same. always used, that he was protecting German minorities, that they were being persecuted and threatened by these oppressive people that they lived well, under. The, 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 and the he course. used that, he, even as late as Poland, he was claiming that Germans were being persecuted in Poland. Yeah, uh, some degree they were, but that's beside the point. They also had Germans in the Volga too, but that's uh, where? 
Germans of the Volga. I don't. I don't know what. I, if, if there were if there were Germans being persecuted in Poland in 1939, it was not nothing on the scale of what everybody suffered no. under Hitler. Well, I think that we have that right well, here. Yeah. If you want to have an analogy, I mean, we have that right here in Chicago to this day. We have what? We, well, uh, Ram Putin. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> The well, after after the our pre- right. after right. our president had a very lengthy conversation with uh, uh, Putin, uh, it was, it was that a long time yeah, ago when he was? He was on hold, hold for eighty minutes. Right, right. Yeah. He was with Putin. Putin got on hold for eighty yeah. minutes. Putin got off the phone, turned to his aides, and said, "Guess what? This goof just told me." <laughs> I, <thought laughs> I mean, that, that worked out real well for us, didn't it? I thought yeah. that was. He hung up the phone and said, "Okay, send the troops in." Mm-hmm. Yeah, what what a wa- what a wasted ninety minutes that was. Mm-hmm. Hope was collect. Yeah. What I object yeah, to is all this talk about how invading invading a, a neighboring country is a 19th century action. No. It was a 19th century action, and it was a 20th century action, and it's a 21st century action, mm-hmm. and every other century beforehand. Mm-hmm. The idea that somehow this is obsolete, that we're never going to see countries uh, threatening or invading other countries again, is silly. Well, well, after, after Mexico, proving mm-hmm. it. He's doing it and getting yeah. away with it. Mexico after, right now is invading mm-hmm. us. Yeah. After... Mm-hmm. After uh, Obama had the conversation with Putin, uh, my suggestion is the ne- next presidential election, we, we write in Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Well, you remember when, when Mitt Romney said that Russia was the, the biggest threat to peace in the world, and, 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 and President Obama ridiculed that. He said yeah. that was outrageous and like silly. Like an insult to our, fr- our Russian yeah, friends. Our, our great friends. Yeah. Are you, yeah. I'm, I'm always <laughs> confused about which conversation Putin had with Obama. Was that just before the election last time? or? No, just before the, he invaded uh, the oh, Crimea. Oh, that one. That's the uh, latest one. They, they, I saw on some TV program right after that happened that, that uh, what the heck is her name, uh, the one that ran for uh, uh, vice president? Sarah Palin. Uh, Sarah Palin uh, suggested this three years ago. Yeah. 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 yeah and they, and they she laughed. was roundly ridiculed. Yeah, yeah. right. They laughed yeah. at her. Well, she yeah. could see Russia from her back door. She never said yeah. that. She never said she that. Never said that. She that never said that. She never said that. I mean, Tina Fey said that, and it's, it's entered, you know, it's entered it legend as though her. she actually yeah. said uh-huh. it. Yeah. 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 No, you can't, you can't see it, but the uh, Russians were in Alaska. They did invade Alaska originally, and then they, after they stripped it down to every, of everything that was uh, value to them, yeah. they sold it to the United States. Well, Stewart's that, icebox. Stewart's well, you know, I, I, this occurred to me. You know, there's another peninsula that used to belong to Russia, and we, it's called Alaska. And, and maybe yeah. Putin, maybe on his agenda somewhere down the road. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, true. I don't yeah. think about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was just talking about mm-hmm. that. because they, That was Russian they, territory in the right. 19th yeah. century until yeah. William Seward, one of the wisest statesmen we ever had, bought it mm-hmm. and was ridiculed for it. Right, so yeah. it, all, it, it. Seward was held up to public... Uh, condemnation. I remember seeing a cartoon when I was a kid in a, in a book about the presidents, and it showed William Seward pushing a wheelbarrow, and there's this block of ice in the shape of Alaska, mm-hmm. and it says Russian America on it, and in the background is the czar counting the smiling and mm-hmm. counting the money, that, and, and the idea is that, that and it was called Seward's mm-hmm. Folly. Mm-hmm. We paid $7 million and $7,200,000 for, for Alaska, seven okay. million Which is how many square miles? dollars we paid for Alaska. Well, they don't miles. pay any taxes up there, and, and, and by, they, they and get their uh, their monthly check or whatever it is. By the know. early '30s, we had pulled seven hundred million yeah. dollars worth of gold alone out of, out of Alaska. Yeah, it was so it was one of the yeah. wisest real estate deals that was ever carried right. off. It was something like four hundred twenty-five thousand. Sc- or square miles in Alaska. Yeah, it was it was yeah. pennies, Point pennies eight. for the acre. That, that yeah, pennies an for. acre. But uh, you know, the funny story is, of course, it's one one person per acre in Alaska. It's uh, yeah, it's still a, the, the population is growing, oh, yeah, it's but very, it's still not. Yeah. No, four hundred thousand. There's four hundred thousand people living in Alaska. Mm-hmm. Four hundred thousand square miles. You got to remember, they have a much better climate than we do. <laughs> it's not as cold up there. <laughs> we could go there and vacation. But the they don't have the potholes we have. <laughs> they don't have Rahm Emanuel. I mean, so. yeah, the, uh, they, they are the very pop- lucky. The population. And now for a brief intermission. You're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Hey friends, do you need an awning over your front 
side or back door or your windows? How about a canopy for your carport or a patio cover over your patio so you can enjoy being outside in case of rain? All you have to do is call Awnings and more, and Raphael Bogus will drive over, measure up whatever you need, and go from there. You can call Awnings and more at area code 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. So if you need awnings for your windows or doors, Call Raphael Bogus at Awnings and More at area code 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Now Raphael also installs hand railings for your front, side, or back steps. You must be safe when you go up and down the steps especially in bad weather. So for awnings or handrails, call Raphael Bogus at area code 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Again, awnings and more for awnings and handrails, call Raphael Bogus at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. And now, back to our special edition of Meet the Chicago Historians. Jack? Yes, sir. Oh, when we left off, we were still talking about uh, um, the World's uh, Fair. World's Fair. <laughs> the World's we'll, Fair. We'll get Not back to the World's Fair. We'll get back to the World's Fair. <laughs> but we were talking about uh, the recent uh, incident uh, uh, occurrences in uh, around the Black Sea there in the uh, Russian uh, Winter Olympics, followed by the Winter Invasion, and uh, and uh, we were all drawing a. a uh, I think everyone pretty much uh, agrees that's a strong parallel to the incidents that happened in Europe after, uh, uh, right after Schickelgruber and Hitler uh, decided that we were going to, they were going to take care of, they demanded the Sudetenland to be ceded to them from Czech Czechoslovakia and uh, never stopped from there. Is, is there anything else we have to add about this today? Do we well, have any you solutions? You've got to remember or? one thing, uh, Putin was in the KGB, he never left. Yeah. Sure, yeah. There's, you know, the you know, one, thing, one thing I wanted to say is that, you know, it, the reason it makes this so dangerous is that there are many countries in Europe and many countries around the world that are governing territories that used to belong to somebody else. Provinces, cities, regions, because boundaries have changed through the centuries. And if you open up this can of worms of saying, now this region once belonged to us and we're entitled to have it back, there's no end to that. I mean, Russia is sitting on... Mm -hmm. Putin controls a little a little uh, district up on the Baltic that was once the heart of East Prussia, the old East Prussia. It's now called Kaliningrad. The Russians took it at, at, in World War II, and it's now Russian territory, even though it's completely surrounded by the Baltics and, and White Russian, Poland, and so forth. But uh, there are all sorts of territories that would fit the description of the Crimea where somebody says, well, that used to be ours, and we want it back. That mm -hmm. sounds like Palestine mm -hmm. to me. Well, that's... That's a slightly different take on that, but the basic idea is Same it's an idea. argument over land. I mean, it, ultimately, it's an argument the, over territory and, and who's entitled to And this has been going on since time eternal. Yeah. Of course. You know, we could say Columbus was the biggest agent of yeah. uh, change in that respect, right? But, but, he was, but, but Columbus wasn't coming to, to territory that had been claimed by any recognized government or mm. power in the world. This was all unexplored territory. He thought he was a failure anyway. So. But... Uh, but Vladimir Putin, uh, I mean, it, it's just interesting that, that that he's apparently, there's no indication that he's not going to get away with this, because he's just going ahead full speed he's on this. He's a product of the same organization, which was formerly the NKVD or NK, NKV. Right. KV, the OGPU. The, yeah, all the different. Cheka. But, but you, know, you don't think of it just police. Now, okay, 
these were um, murderers. These are the guys who had the very they were the uh, mafia. Katyn Forest massacre. Yeah. They killed how many Polish officers? Oh, thousands. The, yeah. There's a story that when 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 Hitler and, and Stalin they never actually met. When the, the agreement that's called the Hitler-Stalin Pact, when they divided up Eastern Europe in 1939. The Molotov. The Molotov Ribbentrop. Yeah, Ribbentrop. Yeah. The great champagne that's salesman. The Baron, yeah, uh, von Ribbentrop. Uh, but anyway, there's a story that when all these German dignitaries were at a banquet in Moscow celebrating the agreement, and Stalin introduced Beria to the Germans. Beria was the head of the secret police, what would become the KGB. Stalin said, I want you to meet our Heinrich Himmler. Mm -hmm. That's how, I mean, he recognized that that's what the KGB was. It was the Soviet version of the Gestapo. You know, an, an interesting thing, when uh, our president talked about sanctions in Russia, and Putin responded, sanctions will be c come back to you like a boomerang. You know, I, I, I find it hard to believe that a matchup between a community organizer and a colonel in the KGB, <laughs> the, the colonel would wind up on the winning end. It's hard to believe. But anyway, to get to the point, sanctions, uh, Pe over. PepsiCo, American company, McDonald's Corporation and John Deere have huge holdings in uh, Russia. I, this figure came was shocking to me. Nine percent, as huge as McDonald's Corporation is, nine percent of their profits come from Russia. So if we're talking about sanctions... Worldwide. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, worldwide. Nine percent com profits come from Russia. I mean, that's how entrenched, you know, American companies are in Russia. And isn't that what we're always looking for? We're looking for I mean, it just foreign shows. products to come here. I mean, right. that's what we sell it on. Let's all get together. So, you know, if if we give a slap to them, we're right. going to get a slap back. And the trade between Russia and the European community is is it's astronomical. Germany in particular. Right. Germany is uh, Angela Merkel is proud of the fact that she's got a very close relationship with with Putin. Does Mrs. Putin know about that? Uh, <laughs> nobody knows very much about Mrs. Putin. No, they, 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 got a, they got a pipeline of oil coming from Russia, so they have to, there's sort of a um, natural gas. edge on that. And it, and, they, and it goes through the Ukraine. I, I said there's three, they have three pipelines. Somebody said they have five pipelines that, yeah. that travel well, through the Ukraine. Whatever it is, it's we won't build this one we want to, they want to do here. Yeah. Keep holding off on that. Yeah. This actually could have been avoided. You know, the, the, the Ukrainians had... had had an application for associate membership with the European Union for a long time, and it was the Europeans that dragged their feet on it. This could have been all settled a long time ago, and it wouldn't have, have led to this dust-up because it all came about the, the breakup of this agreement that the Ukraine wanted to have with the European Union. Well, didn't Ukraine also want to join NATO? No. They, no? It's, it was talked about. They've never, they, never, they never applied for membership. I think they... They kind of recognized they had to go slow on that, that maybe if they got the European Union membership, and then maybe down the road they might consider NATO. Mm -hmm. But they were, they were always afraid of, of rattling the Russian cage a little, you know, too hard, well, too I, soon. I, I, what, what the thing is, uh, Ukraine's are a little jealous of the Polish because uh, they are quite progressive right now in their country. Well, a good chunk of the Ukraine once belonged to Poland. That was all right. part of that agreement that yeah, I just it, referred it, to Stalin and, and uh, Hitler. What I call you the accordion uh, 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 borders because they go back and forth. You yeah. don't know where they're at from that one century me. to the next. But uh, yeah, there, I when I was in Germany, uh, nineteen just after the uh, wall collapsed, we were on a tour of uh, bus tour, and we were going to Warsaw from uh, Berlin. You see all these trucks going; they're loaded with car parts. And loads and loads and loads of car parts, and I was told that what the Polish didn't want would go to Ukraine. So this mm. is what the downward was. But the trouble was at that time that they were stealing cars in the United States here, <laughs> put them in cargo uh, chainers, ship them to Poland, and they were selling them to Poland. And they were sell, uh, stealing cars in Germany too. And one of the guys I talked to said he was in trouble with Poland. Because they stole his car, and one of his <laughs> friends saw it in Poland. He went back with the keys, took the car back, and now he's wanted for car theft in Poland. Are you sure that that Warsaw or Warsawski? <laughs> no, it wasn't Warsawski. <laughs> but it was sort of funny because he, you know, he said they wanted for uh, car theft in Poland. International incident out of that, huh? Yeah. Well, they never went after him, you know. 
that's funny. <laughs> but I got photographs of uh, Checkpoint Charlie and all that stuff. So, so what do we have for a solution in this uh, this uh, situation here? There is no. <laughs> don't forget, forget it. You know, it's either got to burn itself out or else uh, it's not going to go anywhere. Cause well, the, the, uh, my my favorite line about this situation in Obama's handling of it, the same thing he did in Syria with his old red line crossing the red line. You know, I mean, I don't know who exactly said it, but it's true. If you cock the gun and don't shoot it, yeah. it's you're useless. If you're not going and to is, do anything, right. and don't is, talk. Don't right. make a lot Exa of idle exa threats. Exactly. So he cocked the gun. He talked about he was in the in the process of bombing Syria. Then he decided to turn it over to the uh, uh, to the Congress and let them vote on it. Then they kicked it down the road, and then finally said the the colonel told the community organizer I, i'll handle this yeah. and he did well the other the other thing is uh the united states armed forces are stripped down to almost to the point where it was before world war ii well I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not that I mean, we still our, our military is overwhelmingly superior to the to the russian military and every um, mil well, our, navy our, air force no no our, we have our, our defense budget is 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 greater than the next 15 countries in the world put together it's the it's the will to use it, and it's the perception of strength and the leadership. If Putin perceived us to have a strong, forceful commander in chief, he would not have done this. That's true. He would not have done this when Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. But we have a different set of circumstances now, and I, that the answer is not what could we do about it now. It's what could we what could we have done over the last five years that would have prevented it from happening in the well, first when they, place. When they decided not to to. to uh uh, pull out the uh, missile defense in Poland was a sign that, uh, you know, hey, you can basically do what you want. And in Poland, they were upset about it, and I don't blame them. They're one of our staunchest allies. Yeah. And we pulled the rug right. out. Right. Yeah, yeah. We pulled the rug right out from underneath Look what them. they went through there. Yeah. They say the Polish people say World War II is a war they lost twice. Yeah. Once to the Germans and then the Russians. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was told over there, I said, what the, the Germans didn't accomplish, the Russians did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, but well, they said the other thing we were in Poland, they were talking about the occupation and everything else, and they said the best things the Russians did was leave. <laughs> was, uh, they understand one out of four people in Poland died in World War Two. Everybody knows that the Germans invaded Poland on September the 1st of 39. What, what a lot of people don't know is that the Russians then invaded Poland, I think, on the 17th of September of 39, because it was all part of a disagreement yeah. between Hitler and Stalin. They went back to their old borders from World War and, I. And, and, you know, the Russians got along swimmingly with the Nazis for the first two years of the war. They were virtually allies of the Nazis mm -hmm. for the first two years of the war. For all that they like to talk about their heroic fight against the Germans after they invaded them, but for two years they got along real well with, with Hitler and his gang. Mm -hmm. yeah, then well, they made a mistake like attacking Finland, and they... They Which got their nose bloodied, yeah. Well, Stalin killed how many capable officers purged the Before the war, sure. Uh, yeah, he, a sort of funny story uh, with that, too, was the fact that he eliminated almost all his general officers. And then wondered why his army took a beating at the beginning well, of the war. Well, that was the question. He said, turns around and says, where are all my generals? And somebody turns They're around and says, you killed them all. Long time passing. You know what? And, and that, and I've said this for a long time, we here in the United States send our generals to war college and we send them to uh, all of these schools and, and give them all of these uh, 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 the, the orders to, to, to protect us and yet when we need that who comes in? The politicians. The community organizer. <laughs> you know. Uh, who doesn't know a damn thing about it, and and uh, that's all they do. A couple of politicians that are well, that yeah, are just yeah, sitting in there, and about. that's that, that's a damn shame when we've got generals in there that that could could well, the stand other, the ground. The other problem comes in. They said, "Oh, look at this big military budget and everything else," but they don't look at the uh, socialist social budget that they oh, have, you know, strategy. which is considerably higher. Social services? Or whatever you want to call it. Well, if I could just say one word on behalf of my fellow politicians, and I, <laughs> and I, under, I understand what you're saying, I don't disagree with it, but you have to remember we've had presidents that were superb commanders-in-chief. Yeah. Lincoln, FDR, 
Ronald Reagan being three that Ike. I would cite. Yeah. Eisenhower. Ike. Ike, yeah, he was a quiet president. He he was under... FDR, Teddy? No, we, we have, we have yeah. that. But but that doesn't solve the problem we got now, John. Yeah, but no, but that's, that I'm doesn't just solve it, the problem. It, yeah, it's, it's, we it's, have it's an had, individual but case. We've got some that are disasters. Uh, that's and, in yeah. the past. Yeah, yeah they're all you know, dead now. I'm talking yeah. about right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Reagan yeah. was, was not that long ago. But that's past. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, even, even Grant wasn't that bad, yeah. except the fact he had a lot of corruption in his organization. Actually, Grant is, is there is is rising, and historians are coming to reevaluate Grant that he right. wasn't he wasn't the awful president that we all learned when we were in school that he was such a failure as president. He really wasn't. Gee, it's uh, a shame we don't have Carter in there. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, well, the, the, the worst president I think to go on there is uh, Buchanan right now. Oh yeah, yeah, Buchanan and Pierce. Anyway, what did it cost to get into the World's Fair? World's Fifty Fair. Cents. <laughs> Fifty cents in 1933. <laughs> Which one is it? Fifty cents in 33, a quarter for kids. That was a lot of money in those days, too. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I do have some statistics, and then I, I know the experts, Rich okay. and uh, Rick, probably have a hundred million things more to tell. Uh, may I bring it up? And, uh, uh, some sure. of the things? Like of course. Bring it up. Uh, in, my, <laughs> in my case, I'm talking about 1893, that World's Fair. Uh, the Columbian Exposition. You weren't at that one, were you, Bill? <laughs> or Chicago World's Fair of 1893 was held to celebrate the 400th anniversary of uh, Christopher. I'm taking my gum out. Christopher Col Columbus landing in the New World. Forty thousand workers labored to construct the fair's buildings around the man-made lagoons by landscape designer Frederick Law Olmsted. Over 50,000 objects displayed at the fair in the Anthropology Building, the Horticultural Building, and the Mines uh, Mineralogy and metal, <coughs> metal, Metallurgy Building, as well as the cultural villages along the fair's midway became part of the Anthropology Collection at the Field Columbian Museum which was later renamed the Field Museum. Several popular fair products, including shredded wheat, mm. diet carbonated soda, Aunt Jemima's uh, syrup, Wrigley's gum, are still around today. A ticket to the fair costs 50 cents for adults, 25 for kids, and 12 and under went free uh, 12, under 12, and free for kids under 6. 250-foot uh, Ferris wheel, 100 feet taller than the one currently at Navy Pier, featured 30, 36 cars that could each accommodate 60 people, which, when loaded, was 2,160 people. Uh, the fair covered 630 acres in Jackson Park, and the first to feature a Midway Plaisance amusement area. Uh, and I suppose Rick and Rich could tell us an awful lot more. Yeah, there was also some remnants of the Ferris wheel they found not too long ago. The uh, foundation of the Ferris wheel was found in the uh, Palance. Huh? The midway there. And I'll bet, you know, you're talking about 50 cents and 25 I'll bet there was no tax. I'll bet there was no city tax on admission, which there's you know, certainly you, you today you wouldn't get away with that, right. but I'm sure they didn't right. tax it. you gotta, you got to remember, though, you're only, you were paid less than 50 cents an hour for pay, too. You mentioned yeah. food, and I want to mention a couple of, you, you You hit the nail on the head, but Cracker Jack was Cracker Jack, mm -hmm. yes. And also the Vienna all-beef hot dog. Hot it's oh, got a wonderful yes. story in Chicago. Two butchers on Halstead Street actually invented the all-beef hot dog. Now, neither one of them were from Vienna. Neither one of them had Vienna in their name. They named it Vienna all-beef hot dog because at that time in Europe, Vienta, Vienna made a, a, was a sign of quality, meant right. a sign of quality. So that was uh, uh, one of the things that with that. Uh, you really covered a lot of great things, but I want to touch on something. We're getting started. 
How did we get it? How did we get the fair here in Chicago? Now, the city of Chicago was only 20-some-odd years old after the great Chicago fire. New York wanted it. St. Louis wanted it. Detroit wanted it. All these other cities wanted the World's Fair. We got it because our affluent people, our movers, our shakers, our industry leaders, put their money where their mouth is. The reason it was the most spectacular World's Fair to this day, it was 400 years since they had, you know, with the uh, Columbus discovering America, but the reason it was the most spectacular World's Fair is because all these construction people we're talking about, all these tradesmen, mm -hmm. all these architects and that were part of rebuilding Chicago after the great Chicago fire. So they really knew what they were doing. Burnham ran the the, yes. the fair. I mean, he he gets a lot more credit than he's due because Sullivan was in there. There was so many people. Ruth was in there. But Burnham, he actually ended up, he lived in Elm, Evanston. Mm -hmm. He actually had like a little lean tune put in the area and lived on the site to watch the construction. So you had people, you know. Very interested and very. Uh, it's amazing because here, the first skyscraper ever built was completed in Chicago, Illinois, and it's still there. Uh, it's the Monagnac building downtown. And it's all masonry. It's actually the first no one was. The, notice. Uh, the Monadnock this, has no, no steel. That's all masonry. No steel. The, the foundation is actually six feet wide. The building's still there. It's 20 stories tall. That was the first skyscraper in Chicago for sure. And it was completed in 1890. So everybody that came to the fair went to see this building. And it still stands to this very day. So mm -hmm. many things like that about the World's Fair. But we put our money where our mouth is. I want to ask you guys a question because it's all in this thing we're doing right now. Anybody know where we got the moniker, the Windy City? Yeah, yeah. Uh, from, well, Burnham, uh, from uh, Cook, Daniel Greg. Cook. Who's was, Daniel Cook? He was the guy who went down there and, and talked the, uh, on and on and on about moving the border 60 miles north of Cook County. I thought no, it was the, the poli Cook political yeah. talkers. Well, politicians, there's the answer. I, I, I do this at every seminar I go to. I ask the question, and I, that's the best answer I get is politicians are windbags, well, and that's how that's we got the minus the told. Windy City. Here's, Some columnist in New York said I wouldn't put any faith in what's coming out of that Windy City. Yeah. Here, New York has always been after us. He's 100% right. New York has always been after us from the very beginning. Well, they got angry because Chicago got the World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition, mm -hmm. and they didn't. Jealous? Ooh, they were fit to be tied. Mm -hmm. So they sent their journalists here, and it was spectacular. It was never done in the world what we had here. First time electricity was ever used. We were called the White City because it was all lit because up. Of the, yeah. but, but the journalists went back to New York and wrote a newspaper article. The caption was, Chicago, the Windy City, and they wrote about the blowhards in Chicago bragging Boost, about how fantastic boosterism. of a job they did with the World's Fair. Now, New York, there's another thing that I do, and it's in this same thing right now. I'll let you take it, Rick, from here. Uh, you've heard the term uh, second city. Now, everybody always says, well, yeah, New York's number one. Now we're third. We're number two. We're third. Where what? Chicago's yeah. third now in no, population. No, no, well, we're the second city. We That was our moniker forever, yeah, and it still is. Yeah. Because it had nothing to do with New York, our first city burned to the ground. And we were known as the second city because this the is rebuild. our second mm -hmm. city. Rick, want to take it? Well, the 1933 World's Fair was called a century of progress because it was 100 years since the founding of Chicago in 1833. Right. March 4th, right? Uh, Let me ask one other question. Did Walt Disney have any relationship to 1933? I'm sure. 1839. He, his father worked on the on the World's Fair of 1839. His okay. father came to this to 
1893, the, oh, okay, the 19. Columbia she, Exposition. She, he came here in 1890 yeah. with his wife. Chicago okay. was organized as a town in 1833. It didn't become a city until 1837, which right, is why they celebrate. Right, but, but it was the, organized the as, founding, as a, as a municipality. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. right. It was found as, a, as a municipality, it was founded in 1833. Right. And and the, it had to have so many population. a it village. It might have even been a twice. village. He had a tendency to count twice. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it might have been, it might have the been the a village often, form of government, but it became a city in 37. Yeah. And the way they uh, started the World's Fair, when they opened the World's Fair in 1933, I believe it was May 30th, at night they had a uh, observatory, several observatories in the United States. I think one is in Wisconsin. Is that Yerkes? Yerkes. Yerkes. Mm -hmm. Yerkes. They had several of them set up just in case it was cloudy, and they caught the light from a star, and then that was switched by photo circuit. It was sent to Chicago, and then one by one, they would flip that switch, and they would take the beacon on uh, the Hall of Science, the, and they would point that beacon at the Travel and Transportation Building, then that building would light up. They would light up the buildings one at a time, and that star was Arcturus, which is 40 light years away. So the light that left during the 1893 exposition and got here in 1933 right. is the light that they started the World's Fair. Yeah. So it was supposed to be a pretty spectacular viewing at, at, at night when the, all the lights were off, when one by one they lit up all the buildings. Yeah, they, they, uh, they had a gigantic, I think the machinery hall was gigantic. It had something like area of four football fields under the roof. Well, at the time, it was the largest unobstructed. Uh, it had it had uh, suspension roof, much like probably the Greyhound Terminal downtown, but it was huge. It had the breathing dome, the travel and transportation building. They had trains in there, uh, airplanes. Yeah, they said that if you wanted to go see the whole thing, it would take you a whole week to see the fair as it was. Oh, it would take you weeks to see the whole thing because it went from 12th Street all the way down to 37th Street all along the lakefront and incorporated... Uh, well, Northerly Island, which has increased by 60% <coughs> landfill for the World's Fair and incorporated Adler Planetarium, the Shedd Aquarium, Soldier Field, and the Field Museum all predated the World's Fair, but they were all kind of the first museum campus well, back did, then. Didn't the Art Institute also incorporate? The Art Institute, they had the art there. Yeah, that was a women's uh, pavilion or something like that. Was uh, that wasn't the, It wasn't the Art Institute at the time. It was a women's... Uh, well, they did in '33. Yeah, in '33, was, was across the, the street when they built this place, and then the it was something like a women's uh, exhibit or something like that. And maybe in 1893. The, yeah, 1893, and then right. after that, it converted to the Art Institute. That was Bertha Palmer's place. Yeah, Bertha. Bertha yeah, Palmer, the inventor of started the, the brownies. first women's <laughs> first women's uh, activist uh, and women's organization was at the 1893 World's mm -hmm. Fair. She had an event there, a uh, sit-down dinner. She had the caterers from the Palmer House, and she told them, she says, I don't want anything after dinner. It was a hot summer, hot summer night, and she said, I, I want something that they can w walk around with and put in a napkin, mm -hmm. and thus the brownie was invented by yeah. the caterers from the uh, Palmer the House. Palmer House. Yeah, so she for, was it to mm -hmm. that, yeah. She now was, was um, huge. Was yeah. Buckingham... Fountain is that related no, to the? Uh, that was was it before that? Yeah, that was before that. I know there's one we've talked about before. There was one, I think there's a monument still there well, uh, celebrating the Italo Balbo. the eleventh glorious year, year of fascism. Of the eleventh yeah, attempt, the decennial, the fascist decennial of fascism, era. fascist yeah. era. The the it's ancient the ancient Italian the uh, Balbo mm -hmm. and the fascist flyers came in their seaplanes right. mm -hmm. from. Uh, which is how we From get Rome. Balbo Boulevard or Balbo, right, Balbo, Balbo Drive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. seven. Uh, they renamed it. Uh, yeah, they flew in from. They I think they stopped in Iceland. They did little hops. New York came to Chicago. They landed cheering crowds in uh, I believe July of '33 on the lakefront. They landed their seaplanes. Then they had big festivals. They had a big banquet at uh, I think the Stevens Hotel. I have programmed from that and some of them autographs of the flyers. And then at Soldier Field. They had a big celebration for Balbo. Wasn't he was taken the, around and treated like... Yeah, uh, what's funny about Balbo, Chicago is the only one that has a name, a street named after Balbo. In Italy, they don't have anything named after well, Balbo. And, and plus, he later fell out with, with Mussolini. Mussolini was a little bit... Uh, his his son, nose his is out of joint. Mussolini's nose is out of joint because, you know, 
they named this drive after Balbo? Why is it named Mussolini Drive? And somehow Balbo Drive has lasted through it's, World War II. Yeah. And then one exactly one year later to the day when the sea, when the, the flyers land in 33, the Italians of America yeah. uh, dedicated the ancient Italian, uh, Italian column that was donated by Mussolini and the people of Italy right next to Soldier Field there. And it sat there and made it through the war with the plaque on it, which and, says and in, this, in the eleventh year of the fascist era. Right, is that, exactly. Uh, um, is and that, that's um, the only thing from the World's Fair that was actually built for the World's Fair that is actually still there. Well, this brings us down to guess what? Break time. You're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. We'll be right back. Many years ago when I was Exhibitors Carpet Service has changed their name to Carpet Warehouse at 4300 West Montrose Avenue in Chicago, and their new location at 440 North Sheridan Road in Highwood, Illinois, called Carpet of Highwood. Stop in at Carpet Warehouse, located at 4300 West Montrose Avenue, and their phone number is area code 773-283-0100 or at 440 North Sheridan Road in Highwood, and that phone number is area code 847-266-1400. For carpets in your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, or family room, Stop in at either location for a great deal. Once again, Carpet Warehouse, 4300 West Montrose Avenue, and our phone number is area code 773-283-0100 in Chicago, or Carpet of Highwood at 440 North Sheridan Road, and that phone number is area code 847-266-1400. Remember, if you need a carpet in your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, or family room, stop in at 4300 Montrose Avenue in Chicago. And once again, that phone number is area code 773-283-0100 or at 440 North Sheridan Road in Highwood. And that phone number is area code 847-266. One four zero zero for a great deal on carpeting. Start the uh, and now back to our show, Jack. Yes, sir. We we were talking about uh, eighteen ninety three World's Fair, which was a very interesting. Uh, Array of people who were here. We, one guy got a start. Was uh, name was Flo Ziegfeld. Ah yes. And his uh, he, he had there was Eugene Sandow, the world's probably the father of modern bodybuilding. He started as a strong man. But the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the 19th century. Uh, the John mm -hmm. Ryan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, he was born Frederick Mueller in 1879 in, Pru in Prussia. So another German boy. But uh, another one. Um, you see this in the movie, The Great Ziegfeld, with William one, Powell playing yeah. playing the part of Ziegfeld. And who plays Zandau? Don't recall. I, I can't remember his name now. I said it. <laughs> Don't recall. Uh, uh, Nat Pendleton. Nat Pendleton. Yeah. I've heard the name. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, another one was we have a famous name around Chicago, Rockney Rockney Stadium, uh, here in Chicago, Rockney Stadium at Notre Dame. Uh, his father. Rockney. Yeah, so the, the father, Mr. Knut Rockney's father, came here as a cabinet maker and stayed. So therefore, you know, we had the world was rich by many, many other uh, things. But uh, last Tuesday was Knut Rockney's birthday. I didn't know that. I didn't send him a card. Do you know, you know what his middle name is, John? You're a, uh, you have two daughters that are Notre Dame graduates. I I did know, but I, th I told you. Huh? Kenneth. Kenneth. That's just an interesting boring. piece of trivia that is Kenneth. floating around in my head. But Kenneth, yeah. Kenneth Rockney. But if you ask a, you, a, a, a Notre Dame fan that brings up Newt Rockney, you to ask him what yeah, his middle name was. Santa Fe building, uh, <laughs> Notre Dame. And also, they have a cemetery in case you want to get buried in your alma mater. You could be buried on your 
the fifty yard line. <laughs> I guess. No. Sight of the goal. Right, hey, John, John, I've waited long enough. I think it's time that we speak about the most important event at the the fair. Sally Rand. Oh yeah, she did. Dance. Let's talk. Well, let's it, talk about that her. That was 1933 fair. Right. 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 The 1893 fair. Who was that? Come on. Let's let's hear about yeah. little, little little Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. Little Egypt. Yeah. Let's yeah. hear about she was, Sally. She was more more fiction than fact. Well, though. Sally Sally Rand was so popular at the World's Fair that after uh, her little uh, fan dance did so well, they would uh, arrest her and then she would get out and that would bring more publicity, bring more people into it. And uh, there was lots of other little peep shows going on, too. Uh, some photographs I have, some snapshots of some of the stuff on the Midway was uh, Life Art Show. Life Art Show, so you'd go in because you're learning how to do art, so you'd be drawing a nude model. But that was so you learn how to do the art. That was the only pic- purpose Did you bring any it. pictures with you? No, I didn't bring any oh, pictures okay. with the, me. The, just, just check it. The and then they had one. one the equivalent, I just say the equivalent at the 19, I'm a, I'm a big New York but, uh, fan the equivalent of the 1939 new york world's fair was billy rose's aqua right. aquacade, aquacade with all the bathing beauties right yeah. they they also had uh nymphs of the sea was another one where you'd see them That's swimming the underwater yeah. then there was one called this is one of my favorite ones if i ever do a book on the world's fair it'll be called virgins and cellophane that was one of my oh, right. this one booth that i saw i said wow that's a great name virgins and cellophane but the I midway th- was filled. I got this one I think beautiful. I, have a, I think I have a magazine named that. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was that where you find them? Right. There was lots of uh, well, Streets of Paris. There was there's a Streets of Paris magazine from the World's Fair. Would you buy? Which had a lot of nude models in it. Mm. But I got this one great photo album that this man took all these photos of every little back alley exhibit, which you never see photographs, and that's where it was Nymphs of the Sea and Virgins and Cellophane. So they had all these little seedy things going on. And, so, you know, I have photographs. You see a couple of the ladies just kind of sitting outside smoking. So yeah. it was a job. Hey, it kept people working during <laughs> yeah. during the Depression. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kept Chicago. The Depression was delayed because of the 93 World's Fair at Chicago. It hit right, uh, actually, 94. But the uh, crash of 93 hit the rest of the world. But a uh, funny story is Sally Rand did her dances way up until almost di- when she died. She yeah, a- yeah. She was, what, in her 90s when she died? And she was doing it until she was 80-something or other. Yeah, I've seen, uh, you know, flyers from, like, maybe Mangum Chateau or some other place on River Road, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, her doing her dance. And it'd be a picture of her, and then invariably most of the time you see them, they were hand autographed. She'd probably go around afterwards or... You can yes. go wait for her and get a nice autograph. Bill, hey, Bill, that's when you dated her, didn't it? <laughs> Sally? Were you, and Sally, were you and Sally an item for a while? <laughs> you know, that is, that is a coincidence that these two big sh- Chicago World's Fairs take place at a time of the two biggest economic catastrophes the in the country's right. history. The 1893 panic, as they yeah. called it then. And, of course, the Great Depression in the 1930s. But look at the pick- people that they put to work. They planned. Yeah, they planned the, the world. No, it is Fair. odd that they both coincide yeah. with yeah. you know with, with major economic they, collapse. In 1926 is when they decided to do the World's Fair to celebrate the hundredth birthday of the founding of Chicago. I think it was Mayor Deaver uh, got a committee together, and what they called it was known as the Cent- Chicago Centennial Exposition until I think 1931. That's what they could call, it. and the way they uh, sampled public sentiment was they started a world's fair legion for five dollars they tried to get regular chicagoans to pay five dollars which would give them 10 admission tickets so in 1928 and 1929 they got about 112,000 chicagoans to pay that five dollars and that raised about almost six hundred thousand dollars and that was kept in a special fund until the actual world's fair took place another way uh during the after the Black Friday hit in 1929, they had gold bond guarantors. Uh, Rufus Dawes was the president of the fair, and his brother was Charles Dawes, the former vice president. And he, they were able to get a lot of people to sign on for these gold bonds. Gold money wealth. Yeah. Right, exactly. They, I'm sure he could lean on some people to get gold bonds, and they would be paid by a percentage of the gate receipts. And they were very strict about keeping track of the tickets, even on concessions for uh, merry-go-rounds. Any, any concession, they had to use the special Century of Progress ticket that was provided, and the portion went to pay the gate receipts. And that's part of the reason, uh, that's part of the way they funded. The fair was one of the few World's Fairs funded without any public monies. Ah. It was all private, 
and it was part of the way they built the buildings too is they paid they would pay some of the uh people construction they would pay them in uh basically script you'll be paid out of the gate receipts the company's happy to keep their builders working because they know they would get paid eventually out of the gate receipts. Hey, hey Rick, I got a question that, that, for that you. That Italian column is the only object, the only structure remaining from well, the 33 World remaining Star. on the lakefront. On, lake the, front, site, on, on the, the site. On the lakefront, right. Didn't anyone at that time, didn't anyone when they were planning this think, we ought to put up one building that will be permanent, well, that will be a well, permanent part of the thing is memorial of part the fact of it. That this it was, was here. a depression, and they didn't want it. It was cheaper to build, build windowless buildings uh -huh. and cheaper buildings. And another thing is they didn't want to have any any uh, ruins after the World's Fair, uh -huh. like 1893, where the older buildings just, just where they rotted away. people squattered, they started fires. Yeah, they didn't want any old. Uh, old buildings like it. In fact, part of the thing when these buildings were built by some of the private industries like Firestone, part of the deal with the uh, the Park South Park commissioners is that you have to get everything off by 1935. You have to rip your own building down, you know, whatever building you built. Or if it was a fair building, they had those destroyed. But all these other ones like Firestone and General Motors, that was part of the deal. They had to rip the whole building down. Now, they did build some model homes which were bought by a uh, a developer, Robert Bartlett, a developer of Beverly Shores, Indiana. He wanted to make it like Miami Beach. After the World's Fair in 34, 35, he bought about 18 buildings from the World's Fair. Most of them were like model homes, like the House of Tomorrow, and the Roston House. He moved them by barge and by rail to uh, Beverly Shores, Indiana, and put them up on Lake Michigan. Most of them were right over the uh, right over the dunes on Lake Michigan. And six of the homes still survive to today's date, and they're open once in a year for uh, in October for a uh, tours. But there was no thought of having some sort of a permanent no. memorial, something that would tell well, future Chicagoans, hey, this is where it was. Where it was here, here, this mm -hmm. is where it was. Yeah, no, we, no, we have the three museums. I mean, we've yeah. got yeah. Endless yeah. Planetarium, right. Shed yeah. Aquarium, and a field museum. Right. Which were part of that fair. Well, they were incorporated, but they all predated. But they right? all existed but, already. But, but, yeah. but right. I'm saying that that's a part that's of what was that was built on that Did, on that point. I got a question for you, Rick. You, I, I read something in detail. There was over forty-five or fifty thousand vendors at the World's Fair, displaying their goods, like you know, uh, furniture stores. It was almost like a, t a trade fair. Right. It was one of the first fairs where they didn't give away, like, blue ribbons and prizes, that type of thing, but they did sell exhibit space. So right. you would go through and Brunswick Brunswick uh, showed their uh, how many billiard did tables. You, do or you know how many there were? I, I, read I don't think like there's 50,000, but there are... They're in the thousands. I mean, I well, have I have brochures. I save brochures from every exhibit, and I have like 800 different so far. At the time, um, there was over 300 uh, furniture manufacturers in the city of Chicago. Yeah. We it's had the stock market. We were we, the not stock market, stockyards. Hmm. Uh, we were we were the butcher capital of America. We were slaughtering 200,000 cattle a day. Well, that's one of the ways they. They helped build the fair without public monies, is that they rented exhibit space. So right. they had General Motors bought a, uh, built a, a wonderful building, and they actually produced Chevrolet cars. You could watch the Chevrolet car being built at the World's Fair, and then there would be a, da a, a uh, on the VIN plate, or on the dashboard, there were a little plate saying, assembled at the World's Fair. Wow. I knew a guy in uh, wow. Wisconsin who had one. Who oh. had the 1934 Look Chevy right there? Got to be at the World's Fair, and I had a chance to buy it, but I couldn't afford the twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. <laughs> a friend of mine had a museum. Uh, Jim Moran had a museum in the Auburn Cord Duesenberg factory. Not Jim Moran, the courtesy man. No, no, not him, not that one. <laughs> okay, not the courtesy man. Let's but, say you want transportation. But he did in the Auburn Cord Duesenberg factory in Indiana. He had a little World's Fair museum, and he had a uh, Firestone tire, and right in the sidewall it said. Made at the World's Fair in 1933. Who the hell saved a tire from 1933? Oh, yeah. That, that yeah. museum you're it. talking about is the, probably the 
one of the finest automobile museums well, in the world. Right he had now. his museum there for about 20 years, but then they needed more room, so they pushed his World's Fair all 1933 memorabilia out of there. But, it's out now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. But, I mean, that was the, the one place you could see a, a huge uh, amount of World's Fair. I they've expanded. They've doubled the size of that museum, mm -hmm. and there's so many, you know. But that's one <laughs> way they supported building the fair is they, you could get... Firestone, Ford, Ford right. didn't get a building the first year for some reason, but then the second year Ford built a special building that looked like a gear and it was moved to Michigan. And unfortunately, it burnt down, I think, in the 50s or 60s. Really? Could you hold on one moment? John, did we have something in the line? Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Well, this is Bob Trejak, one of our associates who unfortunately is still recuperating from the accident he had. Uh, Bob is a sometime panelist and he does special projects. He also is the creator of and host of Paranormal Radio. But, Bob, don't you have some stories about meeting a few people from the World's Fairs? Well, not a few, just one in particular. Yeah, um, Sally Rand, uh, the oh. famous fan dancer right. from uh, Century. Oh, first, before I even start my story, hello to everybody over there. Too. Hello. 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 How are you, Bob? Uh, everybody everybody there. Her. Uh, well, you guys do such well, a wonderful job. One moment. And, um, Rich Zadkowski Just keep up the guest. great job, what you're doing there. Yeah, you are just fascinating to listen to. And, and uh, um, Rick I tell Rick everybody about it. I said, if Robert. you want to learn anything about Chicago history, some things you do know, you don't know, and some things you may not want to know, I said, you will hear it on this show, because they cover a lot of territory, a very knowledgeable bunch of people. Yeah. So go ahead. I let's do a wonderful job. Yeah, but um, uh, my thing is, um, actually, this year, what I was planning on doing was planning on doing a tour, doing a Colombian exposition tour and taking folks around on the bus and, and going to some spots and some things that people may not be aware of that are still there, that are remnants from the Columbian Exposition that are still with us. And, of course, that would be the Museum of uh, Science and Industry, which in 1893 was the Palace of Fine Arts. Uh, that's still around, and there are a few things here and there. Uh, but anyway, two of the big attractions, I don't know what you have covered or not, because I have to confess, I haven't been listening to you today. I've been doing some other projects you can't, around the house here, which take me five times longer to do because of the injury. Uh, and um, the two big, one of the thing, well, two of the things that were big attractions of boats fairs were um, the dancers. Uh, in 1893, they had Little Egypt, Fatima, who was uh, what they then called a hoochie coochie dancer. She was a belly dancer, but no one had ever seen a belly dance in 1893, so they called her a hoochie coochie dancer. And she danced on the streets of Cairo, and she was a big attraction. And uh, Fatima was still around in 1933, and she, at 63 years of age then, was still performing at the Century of Progress exposition. And uh, in 1933, of course, the big attraction on the streets of Paris was Sally Rand, the famous fan dancer. And uh, I did have the opportunity to meet Sally Rand. Now, this would have been in the 70s. Um, if, you, if you remember the old Chicago amusement park complex mm -hmm. that was out in Bolingbrook, oh, no, yeah. that was there for a few years. Um, at that time, I was just a teenager myself, and I worked um, there on weekends. I was going to college at that time, and I worked weekends. And... Um, if I didn't have a class, I would go in early on a Friday, so I'd work like a long day on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And that particular weekend, Sally Rand was there doing a special performance. And she did this just one weekend and one weekend only, and she was there for a Friday show, Friday evening show, and a Saturday evening show. And I saw the thing, you know, Sally Rand, and I thought, and she was in the music hall there, and I thought, oh, it can't be the Sally Rand from Century of Progress. And it was indeed the Sally Rand. So I did get to see her dance, and by then she had to be at least in her 70s, I'm sure. Uh, but she still, still looked good for a woman of her 70s, and she did her dance, and she pulled her fans around and did everything. And afterwards, I came up to her, and I says, Are you indeed, you know, Miss Rand? You're the mm -hmm. Sally Rand that danced at the uh, Century of Fires. Oh, yes, honey, it's me. I'm the one. And this and, that. and she put her arms around me, hugged me, and everything. And I guess she was just thrilled that, you know, somebody under the age of 80 knew who she was <laughs> that was still, <laughs> still around. And um, I don't know how long she lived, but I'm guessing it wasn't too long after that. She must have passed away, because like I said already, by then she was elderly. But yeah, I did have the opportunity to meet Sally Rand. Mm -hmm. um, I did not have a camera. I wish I did. I wish I had a photo of it. Or well, I do have. Autograph. Um, they I do, do have some, some photos of her. And autographs online. And the way she used to sign her photos when she used to give them away was she, she used to put down from your favorite fan, Sally Rand. Yeah, I, Ooh, I, I do have some uh, negatives I bought on eBay uh, from a bowling brook from old Chicago, and I. I was a little disappointed because it's mostly just exterior exterior shots. I was hoping for amusement park photos, but it turns out they're pictures of Sally Rand posing in front of uh, Old Chicago. That must yeah. have been mm -hmm. from that weekend. Mm. Yeah, she did just like a one-weekend thing. She was there just for the two nights. I don't know if she was there Sunday, but I know definitely she was there for the Friday and Saturday that weekend. And uh, like I said, I just had the good fortune of happening uh, happened to meet her. I happened to be working that weekend, and I happened to see her. It must have been around that same time, Bob. Uh, I can remember... 
She appeared on like the Mike Douglas had a daytime talk show. Remember Mike Douglas show? He used to oh be, yeah, Mike Douglas used to specialize in, in bringing afternoon. back people yeah. you hadn't seen for many years. Right, yeah. and, and I think she she was on there and she she had a, a tight like leotard outfit and she she would move. She used to say the rand is quicker than the eye with her fans. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I remember seeing her do the whole demonstration on, on television. So it's probably around that same time. Yeah, I, I'm sure it would have been. Now I didn't. I never really looked up her biography or anything when she passed away. So I don't know how long Sally Rand was with us, but I'm guessing mm-hmm. uh, this might have been towards the end of her life, or at least towards the end of her performing career, anyway. Because like I said, she was already older by then. But nonetheless, she still did her thing, and she still looked very good. I, so I, I give her re- all the credit. She had re- a lot of gumption. She retired then and raised a family after that, didn't she? Oh yeah, <laughs> I know. She, I know she had married and raised a family in that, and had a normal life, so to speak, away from burlesque, away from the stage. I don't know. She was really burlesque. I don't know. I don't know what you could call her. She was yeah, very unique. Kind she of was yeah. something unto her own. Yeah. Hard to classify, isn't it? Uh, there are a lot of fan dancers now that copy her. I don't know if she was really even the first, uh, but whatever she did, she sure raised that up to an art form. I tell you that. Although I don't think people went to go see her for the art. Do you have any other uh, any other World uh, Fair stories? Or? Yeah, just the one right now at the uh, museum of um, at the Field Museum. They do have a nice exhibit of uh, Columbian Exposition artifacts there. Uh, they do have that, and of course our Ferris wheel, which is at um, Navy Pier, that's a replica of the Great Wheel that was in, uh, exhibited in 1893. Now the Great Wheel was actually three times larger than the, than the Ferris wheel that's there now, and I think it cost 50 cents to go around, and it took something like 45 minutes to an hour, I think, to go completely around in a turn. So for 1893, this must have been something, because you know we weren't even flying in 1893. There weren't even pl- airplanes yet. So this must have really been something breathtaking uh, in 1893. And um, also to checking up on things and doing a little research on it, um, the 1893 fair didn't have a theme song. Like, of course, a few years later, the uh, St. Louis World's Fair, you know, we had the big song, Meet Me in St. Louis, which was a big song. He had a popular song. Um, The 1893 did not have such uh, a a thing, but they did have a march, and it was called the World's Columbian Exposition March. And they did record this. uh, They recorded it in in 1893, actually, on the real, really early primitive... um, brown wax cylinders for Edison and Columbia, and those were not made for home entertainment use, because let's face it, in 1893, not many people still yet had a phonograph. That would come a few years later when they would be kind of more widely acceptable. But these were made for the arcades, like phonograph parlors and arcades, where you put a penny in the slot and you would listen to the song. Uh, So we don't have a lot of copies of that existing, the brown wax, uh, just because they were very early, very primitive, and they didn't hold up all that well. But a couple years later, in 19, well, a few years later, actually, in 1915, uh, the Edison Company did re-release the World's Columbian Exposition March for the Panama Exposition March in 1915, which was in, in uh, San Francisco. Uh, they did release it. I do have a copy of that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm unable to play it for you because I can't get to the phonograph. I had that up on the second uh, floor, and I can't get up there to wind it up and put the cylinder on for you to listen to it. But they did have a march, and it's kind of, kind of a nice tune. I think I did bring it on one of my shows one time. We played it, and we had it on there. Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> I'll recall. Don't, don't forget, uh, Museum of Science Industry is going to have an exhibit of the uh, 1893 uh, World's Fair on computer. Uh, this will be the f- fifth of next month. And uh, Dr. Schneider, who comes out about once a year, does a presentation and shows her uh, progress as far as computer automation is concerned. So it's a great show if anybody's interested. Yeah, it's like a 3D. A 3D simulation right. of the 1893 World's Fair. It's a fair. great show. They have a oh, and they take you on a computer, like a computerized tour of the World's Fair. Yeah, it's, it's, I've yeah. been there four times now. I, I think, think if you go up online, you can. they have something like that. I'm not sure where you find it at, but I think there is something like that online. And also, too, um, in Geneva, Illinois, uh, over by St. Charles there in Geneva, Illinois, oh, they have great. the Viking ship. Yeah, uh, the Viking ship is not a replica. It yeah. is the Viking yeah. ship. Uh, This was something sent by the nation of Norway, the country of Norway, and it actually sailed across the Atlantic, the Viking ship did. Uh, And the Vikings wanted to do this in part to kind of prove that the Norsemen could have come to North America long before Columbus did. And they sailed this thing across the Atlantic, and it went up the St. Lawrence Seaway or whatever it did and went across Lake Michigan to the World's Fair. And it was exhibited there, and people would go on it, and they would, you know, row it, and you could tour the Viking ship. And they do have this in Geneva, Illinois. (coughs) It is there. So Mm -hmm. in May, we're going to be taking a group out with the the Summit Park District. We're going to take a group out there. It's like, um, I think they charge like a $5 admission to go in and see it. It's it's free. You can actually wander the thing yourself, wander around it yourself. But they do have docent tours that will tell you all about it, give you some facts on the Columbian Exposition. Uh, so we're going to be taking them out there in May to see that and then have a nice dinner out there. And um, 
yeah, and that kind of thing. So there are, like I say, there are a few things still around from the Columbian Exposition. Yeah, you just kind of have to know where to look for them. It was exhibited in uh, Lincoln Park for a long time, and the Lincoln Park decided they didn't want it anymore. Yeah, it threw it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah just one? like the um, yeah. the replica oh, they had of that, the yeah. um, yeah. the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Uh, mm -hmm. Those were for a long time. I think they were also in Lincoln Park until they right. finally deteriorated. Right. Uh, but they did have, um, if anyone ever can find a copy of it, uh, they did have the distinction of being in one of the first silent films of Columbus discovering America. Uh, Which they was that? used Lake Michigan as the Atlantic Ocean and the shores of Lake uh, shores of Lake Michigan, Chicago. That was Columbus's landing on the, in the New World. And a group uh, of Chicago yeah. precinct captains played yeah. the natives who were welcoming the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the arrivals. I'm sure they did. Probably everybody stuck their head <laughs> in there. So it's a r real early silent film, 1912. Uh, that one would have been. So um, it's yeah. hard to get a print of those. Although if we can get a uh, Jack, if we can get a print of. Uh, the 1910 Frankenstein, I'm sure there's a print of that one out there somewhere. Chicago right. was a big uh, film center at that time. So it's, it certainly it was. was. Many people don't know that, but we actually we were, were the um, birthplace of uh, the film we industry. The yes, it was. The film yeah. era mm -hmm. was Chicago. We were That's the birthplace right. of yeah. film. I think um, the film you mentioned, it has the one scene in the beginning which shows uh, a, a, a American Indian chief. He's looking out over the, to the waters. With and his he telescope. Sees, and he, no, he, <laughs> he sees the three boats sailing up. And the next time the title card says, "There goes the there goes the neighborhood." <laughs> <laughs> uh, those okay. those were yeah, those were never really too. replicas because yeah. nobody really knew what the ships looked like, you so know. they were guesses. Yeah, you're right. Because um, right, they thought they saw yeah. similar ships of that they, period. They know what ships of the era looked like. Yeah, yeah. So that was yeah. never really a. Yeah. True replica. Yeah, one of the, um, just to touch a little bit, just to get off the Columbian Exposition for a second, but you were touching a little bit on, on uh, Chicago being the film capital. Uh, and actually, we were. New York and Chicago uh, actually kind of had the uh, movie industry tied up for a, for a number of years there. New York and was yeah, a big yeah. center of film in that era, too. Mm -hmm. Charlie yeah. Chaplin was in Chicago, and he was on top of the world with his uh, production. Yeah. Not Ed, Edison, was, Edison was, was doing filming in, in, in New York. In and no, he did. The first yeah. he was with Chaplin Keystone. made one film mm -hmm. in, in Chicago. California. He was with SNA here. So. Yeah, he made he one film at the old SNA studios. No. He made it with no. Ben Turpin. Remember yeah, Ben Turpin, Pickford the Cross Eyed Comic? There was a lot of, lot of films on the East Coast. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <laughs> the argument going on. They got too cold, so they went to the, the West Coast. The reason that that California became the fir, uh, film capital is because Chicago, number one, weather. Okay, yeah. But yeah. the other big reason, just as much as weather, was we had no land. And California was nothing. It was all vacant land. So the film industry went to California because they could get Make land the and the weather was better. Sure, so there was, sure. those were the two key reasons why they left Chicago. But I, I'll argue the point because I read a lot about New York and Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chicago was on top. The Raft Brothers, uh, Julius and Cornelius, that built the, the six theaters downtown. We were ahead of New York, even though New York was a lot lo older than we were when it came to arts, entertainment, uh, the film industry. The music industry exploded in Chicago, whether you like polka music, jazz, blues, the big band sound. It was Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Chicago made it happen. Chicago is still somewhat of a lead now because they start productions here in Chicago to see how people like them rather than go to New York because the uh, uh, critics didn't like it in New York to death sentence, where Chicago is a little more lenient and mm -hmm. they don't care what the critics say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what? I think we, we've, we've got thick skin here in Chicago. And... Um, with my radio show that's coming up now, with what we're doing, uh, I'm going to have an attitude because, uh, you know what, I'm tired of people talking about us like those. Uh, th th I'll bring up one story. They're talking about our pizza. Now, for anybody to say it's not good, number one, I did the research. We were voted by Gourmet Magazine, Restaurant Tour. They did a study of, of cities that sell pizza. We were number one when it came to stuffed pizza. For John Stewart to come out and make comments about our pizza, number one, you know, in Chicago, we call a person like that a putz because he didn't taste the pizza first. 
but he's talking stupid. Well, so I, I call, call I call him I call him something else. Well, but, I, I want to put a put a call him a putz, you know. He do, he does that putz, daily yeah, show. Liberal. You know, and, and, do for now. and he's a short putz. he does the daily show. If we want yeah. silly things, we got enough dailies around here to hear silly things from, okay? So, you know, uh, uh, people have come after us. We've got a thick skin. We just let it go. There you go. Well, we shouldn't We're do that not. anymore. We're not. Uh, uh, Papa, are you still there? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, uh -huh. Okay. Listen, thanks a lot for everything you've given us. And uh, I told everyone well, that you had a, the problems you had with the injuries. and. Uh, Oh, yeah, I'm recovering. Like I go to the doctor's tomorrow, and I'll see what happens and if we take some of the metal and some it, of the parts out of my leg here and uh, hopefully back to normal. And I'm very anxious to get back uh, on the radio again, doing another show. Back to normal and paranormal, right? For a while, so I'm anxious <laughs> this, to get going uh, with that. If you're up to it, Sunday, March 30th, 10 to 4, there's a 20th annual World's Fair memorabilia show in uh the Elk, Elk Grove Holiday Inn, and oh, you want to okay. take a ride out there. Yeah, if I can get somebody I, I can, to give me I can a ride drive, out there, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I can drive. We're going to make it for that, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, say that word again, would you, Jack? Yeah. Yeah. Memorabilia. memorabilia. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got which way he says that. But, uh, I'm going to uh, sign off, folks, because it's time for me to take okay. a pill and go lay down. I'm gonna put, uh, take care of yourself. Stop. Stop. Thanks, Thanks for everything. This gives us pretty close to break. That you guys are doing. And thank you so much for having me on, and keep up the good work, guys. Great show. Thanks for being on. Thank you very much. Good health, Bob. Okay, bye. Bye -bye. Anyway, that was interesting. We, we are covering pretty well. What, you, was there was something? You know what? You, you mentioned about the uh, stockyards and and uh, 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 you know, you, Rich, you mentioned about it too. My grandfather, who was also a fireman, retired fireman. And I was a little kid going over to his. Uh, he lived around Lawrence and Western. And uh, I go over on Sunday when my dad dragged me over, and uh, here's a kid, you know, four, five, six years old, and I would have to empty out his spittoon and, you know, clean it out. But I remember vividly the furniture that he had. It was all black leather, and then all around the back and the sides were, were horns from the cattle at the stockyards, and oh that's where he got it. He got it there. And, of course, at that time, I didn't care anything about that. But then later on in my life, I often wondered what happened to that, mm -hmm. what, a, what a, a set that would be now, yeah. you know. To, and, and, I mean, these were huge horns from cattle from, from the stockyards. Yeah, no, they weren't long horns. They were just regular, regular uh, horns from Short there. Horns. Two interesting points yeah. about the stockyards. It opened 1893 on Christmas Eve. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second, if you've ever been in the city's inner city and the buildings that were built after 1893, a lot of them had dark wood. The trim was all done like a dark redwood, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the floors were done in redwood. That was actually blood from the stockyards that they used the to yeah. to stain the wood. Mm, they actually goodness. used the blood from oh, the stockyards. Okay. Okay. We're about break time? Break Aren't we? time. Is it break? Yeah, Is break, it break there? Break time. Break time. Oh. Break time. We'll be right back with these messages of interest and importance. How are the tires on your vehicle? Do you need motor oil? Or transmission fluid? Or power steering fluid? How about antifreeze? What about the wiper blades? Are they in good, sharp condition? Is the washer fluid in your tank full? How good is your battery? Do you need to replace light bulbs? Well, the place to pick up all these items is at Berkeley Auto Supply, 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Stop in and see Tom, and he will get any part or supply you might need for your vehicle. He has every tool, part, 
or supply you might need from the front bumper to the rear bumper, from the top of the roof to the bottom of the chassis. You can call Tom at area code 708-544-8350. And they are located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Tom's hours are Monday to Friday, 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock in the evening. On Saturday, she's there from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the evening. And he's even open on Sundays from 10 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's Berkeley Auto Supply, 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. He is just east of Wolf Road and west of Mannheim Road, about two miles on the south side of the street. You can call 708-544-8350 for parts, tools, and supply. That's Berkeley Auto Supply, 708-544-8350, and he's located at 5237 St. Charles Road, in Berkeley, Illinois. Did you get any coffee? And now, back to our discussion. Jack? Yes, sir, Mr. McKenna. Uh, just no, no, wondering, no, no, uh, no, uh, Rick, uh, <laughs> what was the idea of a World's Fair come from, and where were the first ones, or origin? Do you have an idea? 1851 was at the Crystal Palace in London. 1851, you have the, the, the London Exposition at the Crystal Palace, uh, which was spearheaded by uh, uh, Prince Albert, uh, the, 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 the husband of Queen Victoria. And it was, a, it was a showplace of technology, science, all the developments of the world. It was, it was kind of... Kind of the the kickoff of the British Empire, you might say, because it was it was kind of the beginning of the great imperial era of Great Britain, and celebrating the achievement of Britain was the great industrial uh, leader at that time. Britain had been the the home of the industrial revolution, so they had this 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 magnificent building called the Crystal Palace, all steel and glass, which the, no, no nothing like that had ever been built before. No one had seen a building entirely of glass. And it was enormous. It covered acres and acres, and, and all the countries of the world sent exhibits. And so this was the kickoff of the concept of the World's Fair. And it, it, it was the celebration of, of the British Empire, of British industry and technology. And one of the ironies of it is, the tie-in with Chicago, is that the Crystal Palace lasted until the 1930s. It was destroyed by fire in the, in the mid-1930s, just about the time of the Chicago century of progress 1933-34 it was a, a huge tragedy in england i mean this was this had become a landmark and it, overnight it caught fire and was you wonder how a metal and, and glass building could burn down but it did and it was so enormous it just wasn't rebuilt it wouldn't have been feasible to rebuild it again but that was the beginning 1851 of the concept mm -hmm. of the world's fair your your, uh, your your last comment about we're wondering how it makes me think of how did mccormick place burn down but that's another yeah, story yeah, it, 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 <laughs> but, it, it, but in fact it did yeah. Rich, That's a bring that. I, I got a question for Rich. There's a uh, washroom out there by Museum of Science and Industry, and it's old. How old is it, and where was it started? A washroom? Behind the Museum of Science and Industry. That's the one with the little holes on the inside? As you uh, it's got the door? Two, two holes, one on each side. Oh. <laughs> but it's old. And, uh, Pinky Dink uh, Kenna was uh, the one that may have been the cut the ribbon opening it in 1880. Was that Sir Thomas <laughs> Crapper's building? Or? No. <laughs> but it, we asked about it, and uh, it's as old as 1893, anyway, 1893 anyway. Well, back then, homes were just starting to be built, I, as far as I'm, I'm just thinking in my mind, were just starting to be built with washrooms. In Prior to that, a lot of homes oh, were not was, built with washrooms. In fact, um, uh, what's the guy with... Uh, uh, Pullman, George Pullman, uh, you know, when he built that Pullman village down on the south side of the early 1900s, you know, people look at it now. I've, I went on a tour and everything of it. You know, 
when you look at that and you think about it, the people were so poor prior to that. These are small little homes, but each home had a bathroom, a sink in the kitchen. You could take a bath. You can, you know, prior to that, you didn't even have a toilet in the house, nothing. Well, you this, know, this so is a solid... It might be because of that. Maybe it was one of the first... Uh, yeah, if you ever go down to the Museum of Science and Industry, you're going to stay going... Uh, uh, you know, there's a park in the back. And you can go on the driveway there. And right off to the south of the driveway, there's a building, probably 20 by 20. And it's a washroom. And it's, it's uh, essentially the same type of stone that's on the Museum of Science and Industry. Well, can I take the show out of the toilet right now? No, don't, don't anyone ever say that we don't cover the really big issues yeah, well, on this I, show. I, I, we, re, we really well, get I, I really would like really to take the show out of the toilet. We've first talked, things first. We talked a little bit earlier about Walt Disney's father being one of the artists that actually worked on the World's Fair of 1893, came to Chicago in 1890. Walt was actually born in Chicago on December 5th, 1901. Now, Walt actually did study and did get a degree at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I've got the article at home. One of his instructors actually wrote in his file, no Walt knowledge. Disney will not amount to much. <laughs> because whenever they gave him an assignment to do paper to draw or whatever it was, he was always doodling on the paper, cartoon characters and all of that. Now, Walt Disney was, it, this is kind of cool. What was the name of the first Walt Disney Mouse series? Was it Mickey Mouse? Oswald Rabbit. Steam, no, no, Steamboat, no, no. Steamboat Willie. Steamboat Willie, correct. Mouse. It was, it was Speedboat Willie was first. Actually, it was the now, second one. Plain, Plain Crazy was the first, but Steamboat Willie was released first, was post-synchronized as far as sound goes, and then they installed sound onto Plain, Plain Crazy. Now, he was the... The, the one that started cartooning like we know today, he was the actual one that started that. And then this is the biggest kicker. I read this in a number of different locations. He was deathly afraid of mice. If, a, <laughs> if he saw a mouse, he'd jump up on he the He said table. that, too. Yeah, he said that. Yeah. Yeah, so it was just a, an imagine? amazing but thing. But he's in that statue, right, with Mickey beside him, so oh, he obviously yeah. isn't afraid yeah. of but, but, you know, He's really big. I mean, you know. I, I, love, I love when the teacher wrote that. I, I always say when I'm doing my tours and that, give me ten guys like Walt Disney. Yeah. I mean, his fortune's got to be worth, uh, you know, in the trillions, mm -hmm. what he built and how many people that he put to work and all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, just to give you a sidelight, similar story. There was a fellow who did his, his first screen test in Hollywood, and the screen test was can't sing, can't act, can dance a little. It Fred, was Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire. <laughs> Can you imagine? But this is a wonderful story because here's a mover and shaker that was born in mm -hmm. Chicago, Illinois. Trip Avenue. We're going to be doing a, a thing on movers, shakers, industry leaders that made a mm -hmm. difference in America. That were born in Chicago. And he moved to Kansas so City though when they were a kid. Was, he opened up the Kansas City commercial. He did he did commercial films to be shown in the theater, like your local store, where animated. That's what started. And then he went into uh, something like called there was a. Like a fairy tale series that he did with all the common and what went on Cinderella, and right. then he went to uh, Alice in Wonder in Alice in Cartoon Land. It was the opposite. Max Fleischer had been doing uh, Coco the Clown and the Out of the Inkwell. Well, he, instead of having an animated clown, he had the real life girl in an animated world. The opposite, and that went, went that brought him down to getting out to California, and uh, he did that for M Margaret Winkler. She handled that Oswald Rabbit, which was Oswald. taken away from him by Walter. She was given to Walter Lance, and he thought he was through. And on the way back from the train, he wanted to call the character Mortimer, who settled on Mickey Mortimer. Mouse. Yeah, his first you know, choice was Mortimer Mouse. My, my, fa my father had a great line about Walt Disney. He used to come home and see us, you know, the kids, when we were little, watching the Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah. He said, Walt Disney turned the youth of America into a nation of rodent worshippers. <laughs> 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 you know... <laughs> we're adding a little bit more to what we're talking about the, with the World's Fair and all of that. Uh, over 600 acres were yeah. actually used to build the World's Fair. If any of you have a computer, you're listening to the show, go to the History Ch Channel and just Google the World's Fair, uh, uh, 1893 Chicago World's Fair, and they actually have pictures 
renderings of the World's Fair. I'll pass it around so you guys can see it. Mm -hmm. But it, it really is. You know, when I do these stories, I, I, I'm like Rick. Rick, really, you got a detailed kick to what you do, a passion for it, too. I right, can hear right. it in your voice. But I love to look at the, the illustrations and things like that. Uh, and real. then anybody listening, I want to mention one thing, too. If we sparked an interest in you about the World's Fair, uh, we talked about it earlier here off uh, the microphone, but The Devil in the White City is a wonderful read. Yeah, that is, as far that's, as, a great, uh, that's a great book. I, I use it for referencing. It. Uh, yeah, yeah and, and when I do my stories in that, um, I, don't, I don't ever copy anybody uh, when I do my thing. Um, a long time ago, somebody said something about something I did on Riverview. Well, the story sounds similar because how much can you say about But I about know that. No. that my stories were from my child. I remember Riverview. And I, Me too. I tell the story, and every baby boomer says the same thing. Wow, you hit it right on the head. And that is the first time I went there at night. And and walked up to that front, and walked in. It was like it was like heavenly. Fantasy. There was you were looking for <clears throat> angels. You were looking for God to come. It was all lit up. You never seen nothing like that in your life. And 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 that's the passion I put into the story that I did. Uh, it's on my website at richiez.com. It's r i c h i e z i e dot com. But I put in that, and then I put in. One other thing that's real interesting about that is is when you do it, um, you, you know, the shoots especially, um, you know, there was no sign on there. Uh, there was nothing to strap you in. You know, you held on, you sat on a plank, and it came down. Nobody ever fell off. Mm -hmm. There was no sign. The Chicago River was behind Riverview. Mm -hmm. There was about a two-foot fence, if that. Nobody ever fell in the river. There was no sign said no swimming, no, no nothing. Nobody ever went there. And none of this stuff, it, you know, we think we're real smart today. But, you know, when I do my tours, I talk about this. Boy, for information, I go to books. I, I, I definitely go to the computer. I, you know, Google's like real cool. And if you Google things, folks, I'll give you a secret. Google it four different ways. Tell the computer four different, like, World's Fair, 1893, Chicago World's Fair. You know, Google it, and you'll get different information every time you do that. So I get a kick out of reading the stories. The one thing I know with these guys here, did I, I uncovered it, but I don't give really uh, any credit to gangsters. or I don't write about tragedies. I write about positive stuff. But the dividing line for the North Side, South Side gang, uh, Al Capone's era, was Riverview Amusement Park. Kind of cool, kind of interesting, you know. Who told you that we were so smart? <laughs> was, 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 John DeVitt is always telling me how smart <laughs> you guys are. Well, well, let's not I tell you what, when you, were, rumors like that. when you were at Riverview, do you remember thanks seeing... Thanks to Rich, thanks to time, Rick, that's how time. we get smart. Oh, we, okay. we listen to guys like you, too. And then when you were at Riverview, did you see a Swiss uh, combo... Playing uh, yodeling and singing and drinking oval too. and drinking uh, <laughs> uh, good beer is what they were. No. Uh, that was my grandmother. Oh, yeah. my and goodness! I've still got her oh. guitar that she used and some of the yeah, they, bills, uh, play bills well, from there. Yeah. and they were one of the big factions yeah. at Riverview. During See? Prohibition, yeah. they yeah. sold beer at Riverview. Yeah. They never See? stopped selling beer, and that's one of the reasons the park was it, it, able to expand. It was a German, the Schmidt family, I believe it was, started the thing. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a shooting range, right? And yeah. the guys went so, to shoot across the river. There was well, the whole city there. was kind of a shooting so range. They were shooting <laughs> guns. Chicago was the shooting range. And, that's and, that's and, how and they ended up building like <laughs> a, a, a pavilion for the kids. And, and that to uh, to be able to go and, and dance and the wives and the kids. And then they started expanding and doing, you know, different rides mm -hmm. and all of that. You know, the biggest thing, the biggest kick I got to get out of, get out of the Riverview, I, I asked baby boomers and everybody, why did it close? Oh, and everybody, you don't want to know the real story. Everybody's got the real story, but it's like, I, I, I bet you, you know, 
from what I know, and all, I did a lot of research on this, number one, amusement parks were, were done. Their attendance was less than half of what it was 10 years prior. Yeah. You know, you we didn't do, our, we're the baby boomers. We started, our kids didn't do what we did or our <laughs> grandparents did. So the attendance was way off. The park needed in excess of a million dollars in repairs at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the LaSalle Street Real Estate Company came in. I think it was like 13 million they, they offered for it. And the, and, the, and the family was already tired. So mm -hmm. they, that's... that's Rich, I, I went there at least once a week. Okay. We lived right... Educated. On, on the... Well, we lived right on the... On the uh, it wasn't buses then. It was the old... Uh, Streetcars. Street the Street old cars. green... Uh, uh, green Hornets. Green Hornets. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so we were there all the time yeah. because my grandmother played there also. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw the... When it was very, 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 you know, riding the chutes... And that was shoot the shoots. And it's shoot peak. The shoots. And, and the parachutes. And, and all of that, the parachutes and yeah. all of yeah. this. 67. And, and, and having picnics, like that's where we would eat our lunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I saw also the... I tell you, the Riverview, yeah. Riverview. And, and you could not go there. If I was a little older, I'd have to carry a gun with me. <laughs> Riverview, uh, Riverview it, Park it was... Nothing, yeah, well, it got, got the uh, kids got in there that were a little more hazardous to your health. Well, speaking, but, uh, speaking you know, of the, the movies parks. came on, <laughs> and everybody was going to movies. We well, didn't there was TV, maybe to not movies, but Mr. More. DeVita? You know, oh, that was before TV. Riverview Park was, was held together by an alderman, Charlie Weber. Right. And yep. he was, he was the, he played a big part in Riverview Park. Yes. And after he got killed, he was, he died at the corner of Addison and Walcott in his garage. Somebody stuffed him in the car, started Started the, yep. the car and he died of carbon monoxide. And his wife ran it after that. That's thing. right. When was and, this? Oh, this is just a few years before. Wherever you closed, I think 67. it was in 1967, right? 67. Okay, right. so I say maybe about 64, 65 mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. And then after Charlie had passed away, uh, the little by little, uh, the, the, the Riverview it's Park celebrated. started to go down, go downhill. And I lived just a couple blocks away from there. In fact, on the back porch of our house at 3528 North Oakley, we could see the parachute jump. And if we would get a good south wind, we would hear the music. And if I looked out my bedroom window straight west, I could see the the uh, the, the clock on on the Lang Tech uh, mm -hmm. uh, school. You know, I, and, I came and, back. I got out of the army. I came back from France, and the kids were born, and they were mm -hmm. they were a little bit yeah. too small. But I wanted them to see Riverview. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, Riverview. Thank God they weren't hey, hey, old Bill, enough hey, to Bill. see the crap that yeah. was well, there. Bill, Bill, one of the differences between you you and me is. Your family worked at Riverview as singers and performers. My family worked at the freak show. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, there was a couple I of incidents. I remember them. The freak I, show. I, I think what put the period at the end of the sentence from Riverview the Park boy. was when there was a few uh, obscene actions taking place in the washrooms yeah. uh, over yeah. there. And I think that's uh, there was a yeah. couple of things that happened over there. I mean, we got to be careful what we... Yeah. Really? yeah, I was with Engine 56 when yeah. we went there. Uh, you know... Yep. The only real recollection I have of Riverview is Two Ton Baker on television. Yeah, two Ton Baker the music. Constantly at Wild Wonderful Riverview. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that they would show the parachute on, yeah. drop. That's yeah. right. He used yeah. to say that on WGN Wild Radio. Wild Wonderful Riverview. Yep. You yeah. know, when you think about it, though, guys, I, I really want to say, when you think about it, uh, early 60s, muscle cars came out. And they didn't really flourish until really 65. And that's exactly when... Down the uh, downflow was of attendance by more than half of what it was prior. Uh, you know, people, uh, the, the kids did different things. You know, and it took a two, two, three years for the muscle car industry well, to, saying, yeah. to take off. Yeah, yeah. But when it did, you know, you didn't take your girlfriend. I, I was part of that equation. You didn't take your girlfriend to uh, Riverview. You went to a drive-in movie. You went to Skips. I remember if the girl was special, and if any of you remember, there was a pizza joint. It's still there till this very day on Milwaukee Avenue in Logan Square called Father and, and Son. Sons. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if she was special, we would take her there for for a pizza. Right next door to Logan Buick. Yeah. One yeah. of the first yeah. pizza joints. That's right. Well, that all may be true, all what you're talking about. It contributed to it, but I know 
Well, I, I, I Tom and myself came on the job right about the same time, going back to the 67, 68. And uh, at the time, some of the older guys told me when I was working with them later, uh, at the end they said, you could come over in uniform at night and they would hire you just to walk around. Things were getting so bad yeah. with robberies. Yeah, and well, the crime you know, factor. Crime factor. What, what was the, yeah. what was the uh, South Side River View? What was what, that? Uh, White, White City, City they White called City. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 White City, yeah. yeah. There was also uh, uh, Amusement Park at 39th. And, you know, you uh, can still go up to yeah. West Dallas, Wisconsin and go to the Wisconsin State Fair and mm -hmm. and really feel safe. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and go through it. That's My right. mother lived right across the street from mm -hmm. there. Well, you know, Rich. You, you know, Rich. You were talking yeah. about going to Riverview Outside Park in the road. evening, yeah. and it was, see all those beautiful lights lit up on the on there. And remember, they used to have two cent days on Mondays, oh, Wednesdays, yeah. and Fridays, and five cent nights on. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Mm -hmm. I was a little kid, and I remember my one of our neighbors took me. He used to play the the skeet ball thing. Yeah, I'd right. go mm -hmm. with him, and and he took me there. And the first, my when I went with my parents, we went during the day. My dad worked nights, so it was like on a weekend. It was always packed. You went there in the day, um, you know. So it wasn't. It was okay. I mean, it was you know it was fun, but I, I'll never forget in my life that. You know, when we pulled up, we parked, and then we walked in there, and and it was like, I'm telling you, I thought it was, I thought God was there, because the sky was lit up. The first time, you know, I, I might have been 10 years, not even 10 years old, probably 8 years old. You walked in that door and everything, you're like, wow, well, you know, this is unbelievable, you know, this is like, one thing about it, though, the uh, merry-go-round is still in existence it's down in Atlanta at mm -hmm. uh, at the amusement park down there. Mm -hmm. Now that was hand carved by your. They brought yep. European uh, craftsmen here to America to carve mm -hmm. that, and that's the only thing that really has survived. As soon as you walked in the main gate, over to your right was the Silver Streak, the, yeah. the roller coaster ride, yeah. and then over to your left was the uh, the train and the merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. yeah, and none yeah. of them had a sign on, you know, hold on or do yeah. this no. or strap yeah, you. No, no, and nobody yeah. ever got hurt. You were in no, the boat. And I, I, I'll disagree yeah. with that because a couple guys got stood up and got decapitated. Or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That was my uh, my they had their heads cut off. They, they were, were probably top. Irish. <laughs> my know, favorite. Well, would, well, that wouldn't make it, you know. <laughs> <that's just> like, <laughs> my favorite ride <laughs> over there was a, was a Greyhound. Uh, you know, I, another, always liked, uh, I always liked Lad's Castle myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially I, since the they had a guy was, there with uh, <laughs> had a little air in the yeah. floor, and the girls used to wear skirts. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> in my podcast site you can go and actually read I, I actually wrote the story and I wrote every 10 years so I put in a little the high points of every 10 years and it uh, like I say 99% of the the baby boomers, when they read it, they say, boy, you hit the nail on the head. Let, let me ju let just, I, I'm a baby boomer. Let me just say, I, I didn't have that sensation. I, I remember going to Riverview, and I, I didn't have that sensation at Riverview. I had that sensation when I cleared the walkway and saw the ball field at Comiskey Park. That's, uh -huh. that's when I had that sense of awe. Yeah. Uh, when my dad took yeah. me for the first time to a game and they were playing the Yankees for a doubleheader on Sunday, well, you're and more... Mickey Mantle hit a home run just as oh. I was clearing, just as I cleared... The walkway, I see this ball sailing into the outfield, and it was Mickey Mantle. But anyway, that's 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 the Chicago landmark that I had that sensation. The only thing I remember about Comiskey Park, IIT, and you was saw across the street from there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I heard uh, the crack of the bat, and I saw the ball wow. going Jeanette out. Jeanette and I were talking about uh, about our show and about history and so forth, and in uh, I think it's in September, the Christian Brothers are having a tour to France oh and it's like two weeks and it's like three grand a person and I want to take my granddaughter mm -hmm. she's 12 oh my. She'll be 13 then and and have her through her life remember that you know where where I then I have things I want to do there to see from when I was in the army but uh, uh, I, I, I thought that would be great for her for her memory to see something mm -hmm. like that. Well, what what we got into was we when we go back through your life and you know you, I, I could have, I would have that. Uh, we kind of stress academics in school naturally and and the various subjects, but sometime 
these are the things we're talking about today are left out as to getting your mind ready to absorb what was there and what it felt like and so on. And as good as technology is, after all, we can't knock it, uh, we had less of it and therefore when we did something or we got to some, it was a treat. It was, uh, you, you could remember the color of the seed. I mean, everything had a different kind of uh, revelation I to yourself. I think it's rich and, and generous. Right, and, and, well, you, right. You, you, you well, today I could maybe take all my family to Riverview yeah. and they'd say, oh, that, it was fun. Yeah. There does, nothing stands well, my out. My cousins from Wisconsin and Minnesota would come down here and we'd take them over there. Uh, me and, too. And, you know, my God, they never saw anything mm-hmm. like this before. And they, you know, we don't have this on the farm. Mm-hmm. I have a well, story. You, know, you got to remember, mm-hmm. years ago, you used to listen to the radio, listen to the Lone Ranger or whatever it was. You used I your imagination. So exactly. Yeah. Someone now, once said that was the They thing don't know what imagination is. Someone once said that radio was better than television because the pictures were better. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Would Chuck Shaden say that or something? Yeah, I think yeah. so. You know yeah. what's amazing? I, I, I tell people this all the time because I am a deep thinker and I kind of look f- in the future. I love the past. You know, today's a blessing. Every day that we have is a blessing. But, uh, you know, the next 9-11 the world is going to have. Oh, will God. be all the computers, the phones, and the smartphone. <laughs> Everything will be shut off. God bless they won't you. I hope to, so. They, they won't be <laughs> able to ring up your order at the store. You won't be able to get gas because it's all run by computer. Yeah. It, it, that's going to be the that's going to be the and next. We, and I don't know that see. we have the backup. You know, the the, the old the old we technology don't. doesn't we don't. exist we used to anymore. Make the where you can switch here. over and yeah. Now everything is. We made right. them here. Now I heard a lot of stories. Well. Number one, every one of you has some kind of a credit card or debit card or something like that. Well, there's a chip in there, and they can f- they know exactly where you're at now. It's mm-hmm. like a GPS in your pocket. Mm-hmm. Okay, when they shut all of that off, you, you want to see... Uh, we will be nothing. But you want to see people <laughs> freak out. I mean, totally. One because the- everybody's walking around with this thing in their hand, and they're, you know, they're texting, <laughs> they're... We grew up in the best time in the world. One phone in the house, usually in the middle of the house. You know, Here was what the phone call used to go like. Hello, yeah, John? Yeah, okay. Um, Saturday night? Yeah, I, I'll pick up the girls, and then we'll come and get you because you're further away. You know, I'm, not a big, yeah. I'm not a big fan of the movie Independence Day, but the one thing, one of the few things I did like about it is when the aliens destroy the satellites and the technology, how do we save America and save the world? With the telegraph. With Morse code, remember these yeah, guys right in the back, these yeah. guys in the command post, and they're sending signals the old-fashioned way with Morse code with telegram. No, John, they, nobody knows they, how to do that anymore because they, they don't well, know. Well, I tell you what, code. John, he's, he's one hundred percent right because you know what? They don't have a computer, Google, or a smartphone to ask it what to do next. Nobody will be able to figure it out. I'm telling we, you right now. We will have people to don't even go to a library or buy a book. They go to John, Google. John, hmm. the Mm-hmm. When when the fire department, and this is absolutely true, just happened in the last, what, 15 years, the fire department for 100 years had a sounder, sounder what we called it. And it was, it was not Morse code. It was just a matter of numbers, counting numbers, when you hit that key. Now we went to the computer eye system. And... A little, little side story on that: Who who made it? Who got the the uh, contract? Was a Swedish outfit. Right. Yeah. And guess what? When the runs come over the, the thing, some Swede, you know, w- with the, with a Swedish accent, was on there. It's the first thing when I was in negotiations. I was, will you get rid of that blank and Swede you have a on there? With that? Yeah. And and but the the computer system came in. But somebody, and and miracles do happen, somebody said, keep the old system going. And it's going to this day, and and in case that thing breaks down, we can go back to the key and send it in. What's funny? We have at the museum, I had a fellow by the name of Ken Falk and his buddy make up a, a thing of this thing. And, and he is uh, 
Uh, he's put it together and it shows the whole thing on how it works and it is marvelous. Uh, do we have a break now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll have a break because everybody's pointing and breaking. We'll, and uh, we'll be, I thought it's, we'll be I'd right go to the bathroom. We'll be right back after these messages. Well, friends, spring is just a few months away, and now is the time to think about your roof, siding, and gutters on your home, especially after this rough winter season. So be sure the roof, siding, and gutters are in good shape. You don't want mold or mildew in your attic or crawl space, and you don't want drip, drip, drip on the ceilings in your rooms or have walls damaged by a leaky gutter or bad siding. So don't have double expense. Sooner or later, you're going to have to have them repaired. So call Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. Mike Best will drive over in his shiny red truck with ladders on top and Best Brothers Roofing signs on the door Mike will look over the roof, siding, and gutters and give you an estimate and go from there. So once again, don't have double expense. Call Best Brothers Roofing for a free estimate at 630-616-1359. That's Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. One three five nine. Call today, and once again, that number is area code six three zero six one six one three five nine. And now back to our discussion, uh, Jack. Uh, is it? Now our host, Jack, was in a serious uh, discussion with our research department. Yes. Yeah, they're having a problem with the computer up there. Anyway, uh, what we were saying just before, I want to get the last uh, stretch here. Oh. We are talking about before, you mentioned about how elaborate all of our technology is, instant gratification, what you said before, Jeanette. Makes me really think what my dad said. He was in grade school at St. Gabriel's. The Graf Zeppelin was visiting here. Ah. It was around, I don't know, 20 somewhere, I suppose. And uh, the nun would <laughs> let him go two at a time up into the tower so they could look at it closer. The St. Gabriel's is right down Canaryville, right near the old stockyards area. 45th and, we'll just be around low, I suppose. So the kids were that anxious to get up and see it. In more recent times, we had the uh, back of the <laughs> yards fair in Chicago. And uh, some people that Tom and I know, they didn't go anywhere for a whole year because they were getting married. But tonight we had the moonwalk. They went there. So I don't know. There's, <laughs> there's some kind well, of talking a, about the Graf Zeppelin in '33 yeah. when it came to Chicago, the, the World's West. Fair. Okay. The story is told that they made them go, I think, far north and turn around and then come come from up north so that the swastika wouldn't show because the swastika was Did only have, on one side of it. Well, they Did, must have just recently put it on there. Didn't yeah, one of those bo- say, That was the f- year that Hitler took powers. That's yeah. the yes. first year would have had a, it wouldn't have had a swastika in the 20s. Didn't one of those hit a building 20s. in Chicago, land on the roof or something? What's funny is I have a, I have a little, uh, you could you could go on a, a Zeppelin, a, a Goodyear Zeppelin at the World's Fair, and I have a little booklet, and it's a little pilot's booklet, your little souvenir. I think it was like a dollar or two fifty to take it to go on a little Zeppelin, and it's signed by... It would be signed by the captain, and the name was Jay Bomer or something like that. And he was one of the, he was the pilot, the one that crashed downtown. Right, where did it crash? It crashed into a building and killed a bunch of people. 1919. But he lived. January of 1919. But I looked up the pilot, and sure enough, I found he was the guy flying that one that mm-hmm. crashed that went to a bank building or something right. and killed a bunch of people. And that yeah, that cra- right. my, my mother was born like two or three days after that crash took place, and like she was born in January of 1919. So I mean, it's interesting you mentioned. I I got two quick 
World's Fair stories that I'd like to do in our in our final wrap. But one make is it quick, Jeff. one is I'm, I'm going to make it quick. I've I've we've, we've I've I've uh, been saving these stories. Sa save the last one. Everybody wonders who was the first actor to portray Superman, and no, it was not George Reeves, and no, Wasn't it was Kirk not Allen? Kirk Allen who who portrayed him in the 40s in. How about Bud in Collier? The, in, and it was not Bud Collier. <laughs> Uh, right. Who portrayed him on the radio? The first actor to portray Superman was an actor named Ray Middleton, who portrayed Superman at the 1939 New York World's Fair. He walked around the grounds dressed for the first time as in a Superman costume because Superman had only appeared the year before in 1938. So Ray Middleton, the unknown fellow, and I've never been able to find out what became of Ray Middleton. They only usually they tell you what happened to Kirk Allen how long they live when they died, but he was the first actor to portray Superman at the 1939 World's Fair. Now, I want to know who all of these people are that wanted to know that. Oh, there's lots of <laughs> people. And who cares? There are lots of people. There are actually people who Phone's are more, been interested, off the hook. more interested in that than, uh, than some of the things that other people talk about. <laughs> you but, know, this uh, is Chicago. i got a problem with talking about New York here, okay? Yeah, well, it's the, it's the greatest world. city in the world, What's the so, uh, so that's why we talk about it. Got the second story? The other one is, is the, the uh, St. Louis. Went to the St. Louis uh, uh, Municipal Museum some years ago in 1980s. It was a friend of mine from college. They had the words of Meet Me in St. Louis on the, on the wall in the, in the exhibition dealing with, uh, with the, the World's Fair 1904. So a friend of mine, we were both hams, so we both started singing, you know, Meet Me in St. Louis, Louis. When we finished, there's a round of applause from behind us. We turn around, there was a knot of people who had gathered and had listened to us, you know, singing the the, the, the theme song for the for the World's Fair, and one of the one of the uh, the guards walked by, and I said, "Yeah, I'm sorry, we didn't mean." It. He said, "Don't apologize. Don't apologize. We're thinking of hiring you and having you come here every 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 weekend and sing for us." Very good. Did you ever do it? No, we we were on our way back to Chicago. Uh, I don't know why, but we came back to Chicago, and and uh, so that's the end of my two stories. About okay, the very good, very Rick. Good. Rick, here's one. Uh, we're talking about. The 1933-34 World's Fair, the 1893. Was there an attempt or a possibility we were going to get like in 1992 or 93 affair here? Because there's a lot of speculation yeah, nine, and buying up property. Yeah, 92. Yeah, I have a whole I have a whole banker's box of of plans uh -huh. that I bought from a couple of people who've come to our show over the years. Plans and projections to have another World's Fair. I think Burn. I think Burn was the one. Uh, Jane. Yeah. Jane Burn. You know that. But it ultimately, it was turned down, and probably yeah. being Chicago, probably would have been a because there was a lot huge of speculation in the inner city buying up property on Forty Seventh and places. And there sure, were, I'm sure a lot of people, uh, connected people, would have made money, but the yeah. city we would have owed they more were, money. They were than renovating we know now. either was it uh, New Michigan or the other, the, which was uh, Capone's headquarters, Metropole. Metropole, yeah, that's was, down there. Me. They were doing some renovation. I guess it's torn down now. Or, yeah, they had two hotels that are similar across the street from each other, and they had cr uh, tunnels going between the two. Did they? And, yeah, and then uh, so he could sneak out the other mm. hotel. That was when <laughs> well, Jane, uh, Jane had her hands yeah. full. Uh, yeah. That but, was probably not at the top of the pile. Uh, the other one we missed out on altogether was the uh, railroad fairs of the late 40s. Yeah, 40, I remember that. 48 yeah. and 49, they, they were also done by... Uh, Lennox Lohr, who was the uh, general manager of the world of the 1933 World's Fair, he yeah. also uh, I did the 48 that. and 49, and then railroad fairs, and then in 1950 they just had the Chicago Fair, which had its symbol as a little swirl, which is at the exact same place. And at all, at least at the railroad fair, they had Wings of a Century pageant, just like they had in 1933 where you had Mid Lake Michigan in the background, and they had rails, they had trains, so they covered transportation from horses to carriages to cars to fire trucks to Keystone Cops up to where a train would, the latest train would pull up right there. Right. And that's why, why we got McCormick Place was based on the World's Fair that, you know, McCormick wanted a permanent exhibition place like the World's Fair in that area. You know, Robert McCormick, the editor, publisher of Tribune? Right. He's yeah. the one who was pushing for yeah. to get a permanent exhibit mm -hmm. like the World's Fair, the Railroad mm -hmm. Fair, okay, the Chicago Fair. Let me ask one other question going back to the 1933 World's Fair. Didn't Ford have a soybean car? He did. They had hundreds of uses of the products and soybeans, all the minerals that went in the cars. I don't know if he had a soybean car. I'm not. They had a car made out of soybean, but I don't remember was that that fair or not. Plastic. 
they're using soybean a lot now yeah. well, in this the was, interiors of vehicles and stuff. Yeah. Ford has got a real massive thing they started about uh, seven years ago, I believe. Well, all this, is a lot, this is a lot older than that. But, well, uh, 1933 or that? Well, in 33, anyway. one of the souvenirs they saw that Ford sold at the World's Fair <laughs> was a little cardboard box uh, which you could put like a three and a half cent stamp on and mail it. But it was all the uh, minerals that went into cars and it had little samples of copper, little samples of asbestos, <laughs> all the little all the little samples, and you can mail it to your friends to show all the materials. One other thing that you can see from the World's Fair is at Lane Tech and the General Motors building at the World's Fair, uh, above the, f the foyer where you look down where they were building Chevrolet cars, above the foyer, just where you were standing, they had uh, murals there about five foot by 10 or 12 foot murals yeah. mm -hmm. which would which covered most of the states it was about 40 or 42 pick uh paintings that were done and it would show uh colorado and they would show copper or whatever mineral came there it was used for cars after the world's fair those were donated to lane tech and those are on all and all the hallways at Lane Tech, and you can see them. You can call up well, those, and those schedule an appointment oh, to see there? those murals. Yeah, they were at the World's Fair, and they're all oh. donated to Lane Tech. Oh. I, got, I, got, I got photographs of most of that stuff. But uh -huh. the, the actual, what I heard is the original, some of the uh, murals came back from the old Lane Tech, and when they closed and built a new one, they transferred some of the paintings from the old Lane Tech to the new Lane Tech. Well, no, these are all, these are all, I mean, all these yeah, murals were given they, to them in '35 after oh, the World's yeah, Fair so ended. Yeah, that was some. There was and some that was just when they it was for their new building. It was just when it was built. Okay, yeah, but they had some from the old building that they moved over to the new building also. Not those same murals, though. No, not the yeah. same murals. I was wondering because that that was in my district. Yeah, and I get to run there every so often. I often wonder what the yeah. Heck those were. Oh, the, on. Yeah, those yeah, are the, they, the they restored them and they look yeah. they look beautiful. So yeah. that's something yeah, that's at the World's Fair. They restored quite a few of them, but they're not all fully restored yet. They got a few to go yet. And here's but a they, name. Uh, the they had the uh, curtain on the yeah, stage. That was restored. The original one was painted over, and then they had a decided that they didn't like that too much, so they had to have it restored, and they went back to it. <laughs> And the Lane Tech uh, Association there, it's like about 10,000 members. They put all new seats on, in the auditorium, and they refurbished the uh, drop curtain hmm. and everything else. So they, they do quite a bit of work on that place. they got a alumni association that some colleges would like to have. Yeah, I've sent them some things from the World's Fair showing, you know, the murals at the World's Fair because yeah. they didn't have that. Uh, they, they like that. they got a good association there. And they uh the but biggest problem with taking photographs to the murals there is they're so big that you can't get a good photograph. Well, yeah, it's hard to get a good shot. And one of the, to tie up one of the things, someone asked, you know, I, they weren't aware World's Fairs were still going on. Well, part of, if you look at uh, Epcot Center and Walt Disney World, mm -hmm. that's almost like what a World's mm -hmm. Fair was, mm -hmm. sort of like. Mm -hmm. They can go to Walt Disney World and go to Epcot Center and sample different cultures and different... Well, we had them in uh, Seattle, that, Knoxville, that kind where of, else? That, Oh, uh, 1876 uh, was Philadelphia, the centennial, the 100th anniversary of the country. Then uh, 1893, Chicago. 1901, uh, I think, Pan Pacific. Do you want San Diego have one? or San Diego. Yeah, uh, about 19, I, I, 1915, 1926. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the sesquicentennial in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, 19, there was one in 35, I think, the Texas Centennial, 36, mm -hmm. Cleveland, 39, 40, New York, and also in San Francisco. They had two World's Fairs at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was How about a, 1996? The two of the well, there was, 80, there was Knoxville, uh, that was in New Orleans, yeah, the, the, New Orleans in 84, Knoxville, I think, no. in 82. Yeah, a lot of them didn't hear, you didn't get too much publicity out of no. it. No, about most it. of them didn't make any money. Uh, the, there's one name <laughs> of, concerning the 1933-34 World's Fair, a Chicago name. He was also a, a, a close friend and uh, oh, employee of uh, Colonel McCormick was uh, Arch Ward, the, the, uh, Arch Ward, the editor, sports editor of the Tribune, who the also wrote that game, column. The All-Star Game, which was... The All Star he, Game, which he created for the World Series. Yeah, it was uh, the co the American the baseball All Star Game, the college, the uh, college All Star Game at right. Soldier Field that right. was created, 
in conjunction with. And they had one, uh, it was really a, maybe one of the <coughs> last super uh, legitimate days wrestling matches. It was uh, Jim Londos and Strangler Lewis met in, uh, the, it was in 34, in uh, Soldier Field. It was one of the largest cards ever, uh, largest gates. And uh, they had some uh, boxing in. Boxing was also they on had the Jack card. Johnson boxed at the Garden of Champions at the World's Fair. It was like a... Which one was that, 33? 33 yeah. or 34. He he would come there and he would box. Uh-huh. But, I mean, they, those they had hundreds of They had hundreds of conventions that occurred during the World's Fair and then lots of sporting events. They had golfing that would take place around the city or up north. Uh, they had the um, uh, the AAU, like NCAA championships track. Uh, Jesse Owens ran. I have a program of Jesse Owens, I think, running in 33 or 34. Yeah. They had all kinds of sporting events, swimming events uh, that tied into having the World's Fair here. So it was a... Uh, a way to get people, a way to yeah. get people through the door because they ended up having over 39 million people over two years come to it. Now, that was, you, you said like that was one of the few to, to extend for two years. The, the 39 fair well, in New York also went to 1940. Yeah, 39 and 40, yeah. they repeated. I don't know the exact reason. 64-65 uh, was planned ahead of time mm -hmm. to be both years. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I know the 39-40. I, I have the 1940 World's Fair comic book that DC put out. Oh, okay, yeah, you with Superman. From, and there was a 39 and a 40. I have the 40 one. It's the first time that Superman and Batman are in the same drawing together, as I found that out. But it was, it was usually the story inside revolved around something happening on the fair. You know, right, the fair right. Rounds. And uh, I guess that's a pretty good well, uh, uh, souvenir item. They had televisions at the World Fair in 33. That was one of huh? the, that was one of the uh, attractions you could pay on the Midway to go in and see television. That's mm -hmm. where Walter yeah. Cronkite saw it. What's that? It's television. Television. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Television is a lot older than people think. It oh yeah. Is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, I think it was even. It was out in like. I think it was even in the twenties they had yeah. uh, television mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. one time. The first, it was not uh, too great, but it was. The, mm -hmm. the first commercial licenses to broadcast television telecast were issued in 1940 to a couple of stations like radio stations in New York. Of course, nobody had a television set. Yeah, so well, if they did, there was special sort of. Uh, well, Chicago time. predated Chicago. I had the first issue of the TV forecast or TV magazine in Chicago. That was like May of 46. And New York didn't have one until like July or August. So we even beat them having the first mm -hmm. uh, local <laughs> regional TV magazine until the guy got the idea to buy them all up and make TV guide. Yeah, the, uh, we, I think there was four stations at one time and used to love to watch a test pattern at night. Well, it's not, I mean, that, I, that first yeah. issue of TV forecast, I think it was called, I think there was like two channels. I mean, there oh. wasn't a lot. And, and you know, bowling, wrestling. Yeah, uh, we got ours, I think, in 49 or 50, something like that. We had old uh, Admiral, if you remember that name? Mm -hmm. And a buddy of mine had months. There was a daytime cereal. Yeah. Yeah. Zenith was, like was made in Chicago. And, and Zenith, Motorola. My, my grandmother worked for a, a fellow that was uh, a man that was a executive at Zenith, and that was about 46, I had 45, a, 46. And I would go over show, there yeah. and pick him up, and it was the original round screen yeah. on that. And nobody else had it anywhere. Not well, even the tavern. You had to get a magnifying glass for some of them. They had a magnifying yeah. glass. Yeah. We were the birthplace of the remote control, but it was with a cable. Yeah, yeah right, Chicago right. was, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time you turn around, you know, Schwinn Bicycle, yeah. um, Candy the Red Candle, Wagon, the, the Flyer Wagons. Just I mean, at the World's Fair. With oh, they had their own gosh. building at the World's Fair, Radio Flyer. Yeah, yeah. just so many Around things. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were the the uh, industry leaders, and in, you know, in the world, really. That's why New York was so uh, jealous. Uh, uh, you know, and to this very day, they still beat us up. They, yeah, I, I'm tired of it, and that's like I say, I'm gonna. I, my attitude is, you know what? I'm gonna tell our <laughs> stories. Gonna go over mm -hmm. good. I'm gonna tell our stories. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and if I got a problem with somebody i'm gonna tell why you know oh. we even got the supreme court justice scalia last week going on television and saying 
the stuffed pizza in Chicago should be called a tomato pie. Now, I've got all these people here sitting at this table. Has anyone ever seen a tomato in the pizza in Chicago? No. Never. Not a whole So he one. doesn't know no. what he's talking about. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Oh, I, I, you know. I'll take, uh, there's some places that do put tomato on, but that's not the problem. I've never seen it. Okay. There's only Have one place. Seen it? No. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it. You're blind anyway. You can't not, see not, those, not, you got those it's not very shot glasses. <laughs> not, not very popular. Uh, uh, not whole tomatoes, but you know. But to call juice. one of our pizzas a tomato pie. Oh well, he's just an ignorant, he's off the wall, ignorant you know. well, he's uh, a lawyer. First he's a lawyer, a lawyer, and, you know, and he's from New York. <laughs> what do you want? And you well, know, the people funny story. from around the world send for our pizzas. I I did yeah. tours all yeah. summer long in Chicago, and I just kind of tell you one thing: the most asked question of me was. What's your favorite stuffed pizza? And I had people from Mexico, Brazil, Europe, Canada, you name it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know. From where? There's five Do I? Five top mm -hmm. ones downtown. Uno and Duno's yeah. is, is, is top. Lou Malinati's. Yeah. Um, Gino's has been around forever. Giordano's. I sent people mm -hmm. to Giordano's because it's everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good pizza too. Father and son. Malnati's just opened in an California. Park too. Did yeah. they? Oh, did they? Yeah, just at oh, Lake in Harlem. Yeah. Malnati. Listen, we're getting there. to the end here, and I've got a couple of uh, things here I want to mention. I, 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 so I, I, one, one thing uh, before you go, I always got a big kick out. I went to New York, and they said, "You know where Holland Globetrotters came from, don't you?" And the woman said, "Harlem, Harlem. New York. Oh, no. oh. Chicago." Right Hey, huh? Right here. Hey, <laughs> yeah, Harlem hey, Avenue over by there. I had somebody telling me, no, you know where Harlem is? Well, I don't care what you call it. <laughs> Zapperstein was right here in Chicago. Listen, I want to I wanna mention uh, a few things here. On the 22nd of this month, uh, we have uh, open house at the uh, museum, which is at 2518 Southwestern. And we'll be open there from 10 to 2. That's the fire museum. Uh, that's the fire museum of, of uh, Chicago. Also, uh, the Chicago police will try again to beat us, the fire department, in a boxing match called the Battle of the Badges uh, on the 11th of uh, April. And that's at De La Salle Institute. Badges. That's, we that's have no badges. That's because you guys get all that time to train. We're out on the street doing our job. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. sure. We're laying around all the time. <laughs> We're over at Dunkin' Donuts. But I tell you what, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's they could a, take them on a fire tour of the city, and they could say, that's where that building used to be, and it burnt down. That's right. That's where, that's, that used listen, to be there, but that burnt down. Chicago. That Chicago has that got the, the, the only Chicago place Chicago in the world. Crime wave. We had the great Chicago fire. The only the place in the world where you have empty lots to play <laughs> yeah, in for the kids. Yeah, the prairie. But that's, that's <laughs> quite a thing. Oh, call it prairie. Well, excuse me. Can I, can I speak here, Jan? <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, all of, all of the, uh, the monies go to uh, the police and the fire uh, uh, funds. And, when and is that, that again, sir? That's on the 11th of uh, April. And also, uh, if the people here notice, my hair is getting a little long. Um, if you Google up stbaldricks.org, uh, you'll find my name on there. I think I put in, I wanted to raise 700 And all that money for St. Baldrick's goes to uh, cancer research, pediatric okay. cancer research. And uh, I'm uh, every year I do this, I let my hair grow and, and get that. Uh, some of the people sitting here can't... Uh, let it go too, too long. Uh, can you, Jack? <laughs> you said before now, all the empty lots because of the fires. Is that why where they call us a prairie state? Yes, yeah. yes it is. Yeah, yes it is. I wanted is to mention uh, a, a website you can go check out to find out some interesting stuff on the World's Fair and other things too. Archive.org, and you can uh, you can look for 1933 or 34 World's Fair. You can see. They have several books, including the official guidebooks from 33, 34. Are, you can see a full text version, so you can you can type in words and search for any word, search for any company. Also, there's a great book on there from 1952, written by Lennox Lohr, the general manager of the World's Fair, called Fair Management, and it details the inner workings of how the World's Fair was planned, built, and run, and how they put it together. It's great. You can also see movies on this, and it's all free. And then uh, if you want to, there's a couple of good books on the 
World's Fair, Building a Century of Progress, the Architecture of Chicago's World's Fair by Lisa Schrank from 2007, University oh, yeah. of Minnesota Press, and also one by Cheryl Gans called the 1933 World's Fair, a Century of Progress. That's 2008, the University of Illinois Press. She used to come to our show a lot. She works for the Smithsonian in their uh, stamp collecting division. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you need to find out more about the World's Fair show that's taking place Sunday, March 30th, you can go to worldsfairshow.com, worldsfairshow.com. And that is the 30th, and it's in uh, Elk Grove Village? Yes. At the Elk Grove Holiday Inn, am I right? You are right. And that's 1000 Bussy Road. Bussy or the Busey? Road. Which one is it? Bussy. Uh, Bussy. This is it's not Bussy. Gary. It's not Gary Busey, but it is <laughs> Joe Bussey. I don't know Bussey's Elk first Road. name. It's not Busey Gary, Indiana, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, 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 Indiana. I'm so glad I found these uh, These flyers were out at there. There was a like a card show on an Archer Avenue a few weeks ago. Were you there? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I just that's missed it, That's one of the shows I go to. Yeah. I go to I've been to every show for the last four months, and I put them out at yeah. put them out at any show because I, I figure someone might. Oh, he, he was oh, he, oh, he's left. But anyway, I'm still who, was, who was there? I bet you you saw our pal, who? the sergeant. Which one? What the heck is his name now? Wasn't he here with us once? Guy who collects badges. No. Oh no, Joe, Ke uh, Kevin Barry, the train. Kevin Barry. Oh, the, Kevin Barry. Uh, no, he wasn't at this one. No, oh, this I was didn't. all this was all baseball cards and stuff like oh, that. Oh, record, oh. records and baseball cards. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, right. I, I I actually bought a couple of things too. But they're supposed to be back there um, next month or this month. I think they're back there this month. Before we go off too, if you if, if if anybody likes history and that, I do a show. I'm on Richie Z, and I do a show called Chicago History and Automotive Heaven, and you can get that on my podcast site at uh, www.richiez, like and zebra, ie.com. And we do a live show on uh, syndication networks worldwide. Go to talkzone.com. Every Friday at 11, p. 11 a.m., we actually do a live show. So tune in for that. Well, and Kugelman, I love your new TV show, Chicago Fire. That's you did a great job with that. I uh, uh, and and the Chicago <laughs> PD is getting over it too. Yeah, that's but, pretty good too. But you know what? It, it it's bringing uh, worldwide. It's bringing some. It's a great show. coverage here to Chicago again. We you know, I was the same. Uh, I was a, a a guy that helped them with backdraft. And that brought us, it still is bringing us a lot of, you know, interest. And now this Chicago Fire is too. Uh, you you got to watch it with a, you know, tongue-in-cheek, I guess you'd say. Well, it's uh, been a good get-together, wouldn't you say, Mr. Cooper? Oh, right? I think yeah, so. We had a this good, is good good very good. We always have fun like this every month. Hope you'll come back sometime, Rick. Sure. And we're glad to have you here. You could bring somebody else on next time. So, you know, on behalf of Al Opitz... Jeanette Frontier, our guest Rick Rian, Tom McKenna, personal friend of mine, and announcer, and uh, Bon Vivant. <laughs> what, did you, what, did you just, what did you just call me? <laughs> former, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, former uh, uh, public servant and, uh, uh, and a frustrated singer, Bill Kugelman. Yes. Fire, fire department president oh, of the union and the, uh, former director of the union of the uh, museum. And for Richie Z, this is Jack Ryan, and on behalf of our producer, John, John DeVita, remember, uh, history is much more than something uh, than a book you keep on the shelf. And a happy St. Patrick's Day. We would like to thank Kevin of Jack FM, WRHS 89.7 FM, and Smooth FM, WRWX 88.1 for broadcasting our shows over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians program are available for your listening via the internet at www.windycityhometown.com.
You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John Nevada Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, March the 10th, the year 2014. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, edited by Stephen Lehman. The, our audio engineer is James Rohde, and the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network is Mr. John Chaconda. Please be safe, and thanks for listening.